Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Good evening. Um, get ready. It's about to be 6 o'clock, and we're doing our lecture uh, for Thursday night, April 23rd, Intro to Philosophy from uh, 6 to 9. So welcome back, everybody. Good to see you guys. Um, you know, we got about five minutes until class time, so I'll be right with you guys once it starts. But anybody who's showing up a little early, welcome. Good to see you. Hope you're doing really well. And um, of course, if you had any kind of questions or comments or anything at all, uh, feel free to just you know throw down a little comment or whatever in the chat, and uh, we'll be getting underway in just a minute. Thank you guys so much. Um, <clears throat> Hey Sherry, good to see you there. Welcome back. Hi, everybody. Just take your time and get comfortable. We'll be going in a few minutes. <clears throat> Hope everybody had a good week uh, since we had the last lecture. Um, you know, we've got a unique semester on our hands here. Everybody knows that, but I really appreciate you guys' dedication and um, commitment to your education and to this class. And I guess. Um, you know, I'm just here to help any way I can. If there's anything that you need to ask or um, want me to assist you with or to explain, you know, definitely I'm here to help. So let me know. But um, in a moment, once a couple minutes pass and we get to six, we're going to, you know, go into the last couple of um, comments on philosophy of time. Um, and then we're going to discuss the philosophy of mind uh, after that today. So that's our plan. Just pulling open my syllabus on the phone here. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. Just about another minute, and we'll get underway. <clears throat>
All right, well, I guess it's, you know, mostly pretty much six o'clock. So, um, hey, everybody, welcome back. If you're here, maybe just tap in and just um, say hello. I'd like that to see um, who's here in the chat, um, watching it live. But anyways, uh, you know, I'm here. I can see you guys. Okay, Sherry, Shauna, hello, hello. Good to see everybody. Who else is in the mix? A couple more people. Let's see who's in this. Dana, great. Gilberto, awesome. Good to see you too. Um, all right, so you know it seems like we do have a solid group here. Stephanie, nice to see you. Um, well, anyway, yeah, thanks guys so much. Uh, today we have you know an important meeting because what we're doing is we're going to wrap up the topic that we were working with last week. Uh, we have just a little bit more material on the time subject, and then um, after that we're going to spend you know, the full majority of today's meeting going over a new subject, which is the philosophy of mind, and that'll carry us into um, next week as well. Um, <clears throat> here's another question I'd like to ask some of you guys. Did anybody notice my um, Canvas message sent to the class today? Let me know if you did, because um, that'll confirm for me that there's no issues with the delivery and that I don't have to resend it or anything like that. Did you guys notice this? Um, if not, maybe you can check and just verify. But I sent a message today. Okay, good, Dana. So I delivered everybody the um, the prompts for the second essay topic. Okay, so I also made an adjustment to the due date. Um, yes, good. Thank you, guys. Um, perfect. And hi, Maria. Nice to see you too. So yes, I sent the topics for the uh, upcoming paper. I moved the due date out a little bit, of course. Um, to, to account for the fact that we had a change in our schedule with the whole pandemic outbreak. Um, so in the note, you'll see that it says it's due on the, uh, uh, what is that, the 14th. So we've made it due Thursday, May 14th, a two-week postponement. So it's due that day, but you have you know a lot of time to work on it. From now until then is three weeks. So there's a full three weeks that you have with the prompts to develop and write your paper. Uh, let's see. I'll try to pull up the prompts and just talk with you guys about them for a minute. That's, I guess, the first order of business to get clear on the prompts. So hold on. Okay. All right. So um, I'm just going to read off of the directions here. Um, and of course, not to worry about getting the additional time. It's it's nice to um, have the margin that we need to make sure that everybody's comfortable on this. But it says here, okay, I'm reading from the prompt, from the directions. You must write a three to four page essay, double spaced in 12 point font with normal margins on one of these three prompts below. Okay, so just about that piece of information there. That's just the format guidelines. That's not different from the first paper. So uh, you wanna just carry over the same um, you know, requirements that you used to write your first paper for this one. That's the same. So it's three to four pages. You want these to be double spaced pages of typed um, writing. And it's 12 point font, so I don't want it to be larger or smaller than that. 12 point font, exactly. Normal margins, no adjustment to the default margins of your word processor, and just on one of those three prompts. So, you know, you've got to take your pick. But you can't write on all of them. You have to just pick one of those three. So whichever one you found to be, you know, um, the easiest to describe or explain, or the one you thought you could write the strongest paper on, then that would be your choice. But you know, you just have to choose one of the three. Um, <clears throat> and okay, about the page length requirement, it says three to four. Um, I look at it as if you're going to go over four, that's fine. You can be flexible with the upper boundary. Uh, so don't worry if you're running out of space and you have more to say as you get close to the end of the fourth page, then you could just go on and continue um, for however many more pages. But four is a good baseline. Um, now, if it's less than three, though, that's definitely a bigger problem. So 
If it's less than three, it's probably not at all going to be detailed enough to address the topic. So you, you know, the upper boundary of four pages is like a harder boundary and the lower boundary of three, sorry, I'm saying it opposite. Let me repeat myself, okay? The upper boundary of four pages is flexible and that's something that you can surpass. But the lower boundary of three is a harder boundary that I don't want you to go below if that's possible for you. So no less than three, but it's okay to be more than four. Um, <clears throat> all right, now, next up it just says no internet resources or assistance are permitted. You gotta take that very seriously, okay? No, you can't go on the internet. No, you can't find any information about these topics from anywhere else except for the book, this class lecture, and your own good common sense. So you'll use your notes and you'll use the book to write the paper, but you're not going to use the internet. Uh, if this had been a class that we took hundreds of years ago, there wouldn't be an internet and there wouldn't be electricity. So I want you to pretend there's no such thing as electricity. Maybe there's such things as typewriters. Maybe there's such things as paper books but no way can you even turn on a computer because they haven't been built. Maybe they'll never be built. I don't want you to use the computer to cheat, okay, basically. So no, you can't go on the internet and find stuff that other people wrote about this. If you did, it wouldn't be good for you. It's not what you want, so just telling you, keep it honest, I trust that you will, but there have been a few cases, you know, they always pop up where a few students think they're gonna, you know, try and outsmart the professor and turn in something that they did not write. But I'm not the one to do that for, so you're not gonna do that to me, okay? Anyway, you shouldn't do it to anybody. It's a moral thing, it's not just, you know, getting caught, it's also wrong. You should feel guilt if you ever thought about doing it, but don't do it. All right, uh, so then after that, <clears throat> it says it's due in class on um, Thursday, uh, May the, what did I tell you? Because I'm looking at a different prompt here. Anyway, it's May the 14th, yeah, due Thursday, May 14th. Um, <clears throat> and it's worth 25% of your grade. So this paper's worth 25% of your grade. Your first paper was 15. The midterm was 30. So based on your first paper and midterm, you have 45% of the class grade complete. This is 25 more. That brings us up to 70. And then the final, which is, of course, the last thing on May 21st, that's 30% uh, of the grade. So we'll, we'll definitely have a study guide and a study session, review session for the final. Um, we're going to do that review session on the same day that you're your final paper is due. So you have two more things in the class. The next one coming up is this paper, and then the week after it, you have the final. I'll be sure to grade your guys' papers uh, well enough in advance of the final so that you could ask for your grade and score um, and any comments uh, at least a few days prior to the test. So I'll definitely you know, guarantee you that they'll be ready over the weekend, and then um, you can check on your score so that you know exactly where you're at going into that final. Okay, so anyways, um, then there's these three topics. I'll just read off the topics and say maybe one or two things about each one. Now, the first topic here at the beginning, that is that is a topic that we're going to start developing today. So anybody who looked at the three topics and was kind of confused, what's that first one all about? Well, I mean, that makes sense because the first prompt is something that is yet to be discussed in the class meetings. So after today, we'll have much more you know, knowledge and um, insight as to what number one is about. But so forgive me if it's lacking a little context, but I'll just read the prompt anyway. So it says, number one prompt, monism or dualism. This first prompt is basically about the philosophy of mind. And the topic monism and dualism, we will explain and justify what that is all about today. But anyway, here's what it says. It says, explain the concept of dualism and monism, and then explain the concept of supervenience physicalism. Okay, concepts and uh, definitions yet to be explained today. It says, then, you may refer to the works of these four authors in our class. So, Descartes, Stoljar, Smart, and Turing. So, those are four authors that, between this week and next week, we're going to go over all those guys. So, by the time of the end of next week's meeting, you'll have all the content that you would need if you chose to write on the first prompt. So, I would tell you, if you're thinking of the first prompt, maybe you would want to wait, perhaps, to... Uh, Delay the starting of it until after you've heard these lectures on the topic so you have the maximum amount of um, insight into it. But of course, people can write starting at any time after now I've delivered the prompts. So yeah, explain the concept of dualism and monism and then explain the concept of supervenience, physicalism. You can refer to the works of Descartes, Stoljar, Smart, and Turing. And then finally, state your own view of which thesis you prefer and why. So you would tell me at the end of that paper, did you, find, uh, did you think that dualism was more reasonable plausible or did you think that monism was? So that's one topic. It's on the philosophy of mind. Details to follow, but that's an option for you. Okay. Number two is about time. So that's this topic that uh, we were spent on last week mostly on and that we're going to wrap up today. 
But time, it says this, <clears throat> explain the way that Einstein changed the understanding of time with his theory of relativity, using our assigned readings, class lectures, and video presentations. That video presentation is part of the prompt. I guess I should have taken that out because in the ordinary semester, we would have watched some video on the theory of relativity and also the film time crimes. But, you know, just don't worry about that. Just We didn't watch them. So that's not part of the material you're expected to, to, to have looked at. Anyway, so using our assigned readings and class lectures, explain the idea of the relativity of simultaneity, the three ways that time is like space, according to Ted Sider, and the way that space-time theory eliminates the idea that time moves, okay? And finally, state whether you prefer Einstein's concept of time or the classical view that existed before him and why. Okay, so if you chose to write on that topic, you'd have to do a few things. You have to explain the relativity of simultaneity, go over the lightning bolt example of Einstein and explain what's going on there, how it could be that two different observers would have two different um, observations of the order of these two lightning strikes. One person saying that they did happen simultaneously based on their position, state of motion, and another observer who's passing through the scene in constant velocity, surpasses the midpoint and sees B happening prior to A. Uh, you'd have to go over that example. You'd have to tell me how this ex implies that um, time is not linear in the same way that Newton thought and that time and space are actually integrated because the velocity and position of things in space affects the ordering of events and even the rate of time's passage because time dilation is another fact uh, within the theory of relativity. Okay, and then you would tell me about how Ted Sider, the next author in the sequence, uh, says that the ordinary concept of time is kind of puzzling because there's no way to make correct sense of the idea that time moves. Then you could explain how the space-time theory changes that by instead claiming that we're made out of temporal and spatial parts and that time doesn't really move because all the parts are fully laid out in the space-time system. Um, you would also mention about how time and space have these three distinct similarities that Ted Sider talked about. So in terms of reality, in terms of parts, and in terms of the words here and now. And then finally, at the end of that paper, you'd give me your view. Did you think that the classical Newtonian's uh, way of looking at time was better or more plausible to you? Or do you find the theory of relativity and Einstein's conception of time to be better than that, and why. Okay, so that's another option. And then the third one is about knowledge, the theory of knowledge, epistemology, that we've finished with um, a couple weeks ago. So it says, explain the classical idea that knowledge can be defined by three separately necessary and jointly sufficient conditions. Okay, so what it's talking about there is the definition of knowledge that's the classical old school one that came from the Greeks. So it's talking about justified true belief being the, the right definition of knowledge. Um, so you'd have to go over that definition by explaining each of the conditions, justification, truth, and belief. And then you have to explain why all of them are needed in order for you to have knowledge, but it's not enough unless all of them are present together. So like combinations of two out of three would not be sufficient for knowledge. So you have to just explain each of the uh, requirements. Um, and then you might have to give like hypothetical examples of subjects that have got some of the conditions satisfied, but not others and then explain how according to intuition and common sense, that would not be a case of knowledge. You could also mention the uh, work of Socrates and Plato and the dialogue called the Mino, where Socrates claims that justified true belief is what knowledge is, but he also discusses a little bit about how justification is so important because as he says, um, that is the element that upgrades a correct opinion into knowledge. And um, he says that justification has this unique feature of making the correct opinion stable and likely to stay in your belief system. So he compares the justification to ropes that physically ground these mythical Daedalist sat statues. So if you had such a statue, it'd be better to have it with ropes because the ropes make sure it doesn't leave. And justification is similar because it keeps your correct true beliefs um, from leaving your mind. When you have a true opinion, but it's not based on anything, then you'd likely to forget it or change your mind about it. But when you have a justification, right, you have the facts and reasons to base the belief on, then that both prevents you from forgetting it and allows you to retain it, um, and you won't change your mind about that. So, okay, and then next it says, explain how Gettier showed that the classical definition was insufficient. So you'd go over these Gettier cases, at least one of them. You know, Smith and Jones job hunt is probably the most obvious one to, to use, but there's others too. And you go over the case and explain how in that example, the subject has justified true belief, and you say why but yet they don't really know because it's just a matter of mere luck that their belief 
formed on the basis of the evidence they actually had turned out to be true. Because in all these Gettier cases, there's a mismatch between the factors that led the person to believe the proposition and then the different factors or facts which caused the proposition to be true. Okay, and then finally at the end, you would discuss whether you prefer the old school classical JTB account of knowledge, justified true belief, or did you think that Gettier's criticism of it was better, more accurate, and why did you have that preference? Okay, so those are three topical uh, options for you, either knowledge, time, or the mind. Um, you got a lot of time to work on it, and as usual, if anybody's working on their paper and they need a little help or they would like to have some feedback, you know, I'm happy to help. So as the time gets closer to the due date and you have any notes or a draft, um, definitely you can feel free to send it over to me, and um, if you can provide me with enough time, I can get you back some comments and that can help out with the final draft of your paper. So I'm here to help if I can in any way. If you seek me out, I'll definitely give you some comments on your draft if you want. You don't have to, but you can. Um, <clears throat> and about style, uh, just a reminder about the style of writing a philosophy essay. You just want to be kind of cold, straightforward, to the point, factual. Uh, the genre of writing is a little more like a clinical, like a legal brief, not so much like a poet. Um, you're trying to present an argument and provide proof and through the writing of this essay that you do understand these ideas and concepts. So that's your admission here. Um, say it in a straightforward, direct, and clear way. Um, also, the structure of such a paper, I've said it before and I just repeat that I think it's best to just focus on the body paragraphs of such a paper. The intro and conclusion, that's not really too important, so you don't even need them. Um, you don't have to state a thesis. You don't have to summarize the results at the end. You can just attack the prompt by going straight into the body paragraphs um, from the first point. But if you don't want to do that, and you're so wedded to the traditions of writing English essays, then that's fine too, but I would say just keep it minimalist. With your intro and conclusion, you know, we don't need a lot of uh, setting up. Just getting into the analysis would be the best. And then also, last thing, uh, <clears throat> when it comes to the, the header on the first page, I prefer not to have a big uh, ton of information that takes up half the first page. I don't like to have, let's say, name, date, class, professor, student ID number, um, then the title's huge, and then we have a giant intro paragraph, and finally if it's on the second page where the actual essay kind of starts. So no, don't do that. Either have a minimal header where you just have your name, date, and the title in, in typical font, not a giant font or you can create a separate cover page and then begin the actual writing at the top of page one. Um, so I feel like that's pretty much everything I can think of uh, to give you some good guidance on this paper. But let me know, is there anything I've not mentioned or that I could repeat or clarify? If this makes sense, then we're good to go on this um, particular piece of information and we can move on and get into our lecture. But that's it, there's a paper due on the 14th. You got three weeks, you got three topics. You're going to pick a topic, and if you want to review my comments here, of course, you can always watch the replay of this lecture. Uh, they're all archived on the YouTube channel that we're working with. So, I don't know. Shall I interpret this uh, non-responsiveness as affirm affirmation that we're all good? I guess so, because if not, you would let me know. All right, everybody, so that's that. Um, well... We have a little bit of business then to finish with this material on time. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Sherry, uh, and everybody else. So let's go back over it quickly and um, finish what we have to finish. So last week, we jumped into a new topic in the class, and it was the topic of uh, time and the metaphysics of, of time. Um, sorry, I'm just pulling up my syllabus here, so it got it handy for me. <clears throat> just so I see as much of our dates on my phone here. Okay, yeah, so anyway, we spent last week talking about time. And um, let me just take it back to the beginning. First of all, we read Einstein. <clears throat> Einstein is trying to show the reader something very important about time. What he's trying to show us is that the concept of two events being simultaneous is relative. There's actually no objective fact about two events in space-time ever being simultaneous. It does just depend on the position, velocity of the observer of the given events relative to other observers in space-time. 
So he said, like, if you have a lightning, uh, sorry, if you have two lightning bolts that strike at these two points on a railway track, and you say that they happen simultaneously, his next question is, well, what does that mean that they were simultaneous? Sounds like a simple question, but it's actually not so easy to answer because any attempt to answer it kind of leads you to say something like, you know, they happened at the same time. But we're asking a sort of deeper question. What does it mean for two things to happen at the same time? Or the way Einstein puts it, could we give an explanation of two events being simultaneous that is so clear that we could actually develop an experiment to test whether the two lightning bolts were this happening simultaneously? What's the test, basically? What's the test that we could actually perform that we could conduct to get an answer to this question by means of the test? Okay, so he says do this. Measure the distance between A and B. Find the midpoint, M, and place an observer there at M. This observer standing motionless at the midpoint M. So he's equally distant from A and from B. Now, if he sees these two events, the two lightning bolts happen at once from his stationary position at M, then we would consider the two events to be simultaneous relative to him as long as we add one additional assumption, which is that the speed of light is always constant and fixed. Because think about that. If the speed of light is constant, meaning that it goes the same pace from A to M as it does from B to M, then because this person receives the two light signals at once, at the point M, that means that the two light signals emitted from A and B have reached M at the same time, having traveled the same distance at the same pace. Therefore, they must have departed from A and B at the same moment, which means they're simultaneous. But okay, if we took a second observer, we place the second observer on a train that's in motion, going from left to right, with constant velocity v, and he passes through the midpoint as he experiences the midpoint on his traveling train, then if he intersects with M at the split moment that this guy is conducting his observation while standing still, the second observer, this guy on the train who's in motion, will not see A and B happening simultaneously. And the reason, if you remember, is because given his velocity, he's going to be moving farther from A, closer to B. So he, unlike the guy positioned motionless at M, cannot, uh, cannot have the two light signals reach him at once because they're moving at the same pace, but one has farther to go to get to him, that's namely A. So he'll receive the light signal from B first, then A, and therefore he'll see A as happening um, in the present and B happening, sorry, B happening in the present and A happening in the future. They're out of sequence, they're non-simultaneous. The one that he's closer to, moving closer towards, will be perceived first. And now that really kind of just opens up a whole bunch of weird puzzling results. It means, for example, that there's no way to order events in space-time, that there's no like linear sequence of events that's the one correct order. You might be thinking, well, they actually were simultaneous. Um, and the other guy is just seeing something that's a distortion of reality because he's moving. But that's not the right way to think about it because there's no privileged observer or vantage point from which to observe the events in space-time. So they each have equal, claim to being the observer with the correct perception of the events. So if events in space-time have uh, no ordering, that means that they're all simultaneously real, which means that every event in the entire structure of space-time, including everything in the past, present, and future, all those moments are real. Now, expanding on that insight, we had the philosopher Ted Sider. So now I'm going to review the Ted Sider for you just a minute. Um, and of course, anybody who thinks about writing on the second prompt, you know, all these summaries and reviews, uh, it would be helpful to you, I hope. Okay, so Ted Sider's paper is just called Time, and his goal there was to try and explain what are some of the fundamental puzzles and paradoxes that emerge when you try to think about time in a deep um, philosophical way. Okay, so one thing he says is really strange and weird about time is that when we talk a bit about it in everyday life, we usually say stuff that implies that time moves. You know, we say time flies, time is passing, time waits for nobody, uh, time is marching on and all that. Um, <clears throat> but that implies or at least signifies the idea of time moving. But it's hard to explain what that actually means for time to move. And he says that's such a weird thing to explain because when you say that anything moves at all, even just through space, right, what that means is that it's at different places at different times. So if a train, for example, you know, leaves from California and gets to, I don't know, Arizona, the only way it can make that trip from point A to B is by not being at point A the whole time. It has to be at different parts of space at different times to make that journey to B. 
So if objects move through space by being in different places at different times, then if time moves, it would appear to imply that it is moving by being at different places at different times. But that's so circular. There we are saying that time moves because it's in different places at different times, but we're talking about time itself. So how can we use time to create a basis in order to judge the movement of it? Um, so that doesn't really work. He says, if you say that the present moment is moving around and that's the idea that time moves, he says, this doesn't really fare any better uh, because if I say, for example, that right now the present moment is 625 and in 30 minutes the present moment will be 655, um, all I'm saying is that the present moment's at different places at different times. It's changing its position over time. But still yet, we're again referring to time in an analysis of its own movement. So he says there's a better way to get out of this whole puzzle. Let's just abandon ship and say, never mind, there's no such thing as time moving. Instead, embrace the space-time theory, which has one implication that time does not move at all. It just jointly um, contains all the events and moments of space-time together with space. They're integrated together, and there's no um, unfolding of events over time. There's just all the events there. And then sort of the puzzle is to explain why we appear to think that there's just the present moment and that time goes in a linear direction. Um, <clears throat> to give sense and structure to the thought of what space-time theory is, he gives us these space-time diagrams to think about. These space-time diagrams show the existence of an object over some period of time. Um, so what they display are the spatial uh, dimensions and also a time dimension along which the object stretches as it continues to exist. In the space-time diagram, if you cut a cross section, like this t-axis is the time axis. So if a person lived from 2000 to 2020, like a 20 year old, we could show their existence on the graph like seen here. Their growth along the x-axis is to demonstrate their physical growth in space along the spatial dimensions, and the extension along the t-horizontal axis is to indicate the duration of their existence over time. In these diagrams, if you were to cut a cross-section through it, like one individual slice of that space-time worm, then that would be what is called a temporal part. Okay, now a temporal part of an object is just a fancy word for that object at one moment of time. So according to space-time theory, we are built out of not just our body parts, which are spatial parts, but also temporal parts. So there's parts of you in the future, there's parts of you in the past, there's one little part of you that's present at this moment, but that present part is not the only part that exists. They're all equally real. Um, it's not that the present moment's the only real moment. So you taking the final on uh, Thursday the 21st, provided that everything works out as I hope it does, uh, that already exists. That part of space-time is out there. And I guess you'll experience it when the temporal part which is assigned to that part of space-time uh, becomes you, or becomes is the sequence uh, within the overall set of temporal parts that becomes uh, your experience. You, therefore, are an aggregation of all the spatial and temporal parts taken as a sum. So you're never fully present in an individual moment of time if this theory is correct. You watching this lecture are watching it as a series of your temporal parts, but since there are temporal parts of you that predate the lecture, and that I assume exist after it, then you're not fully present. Only a sequence, a small subset of your overall timeline is attending this lecture. Okay. With the temporal parts, we are told that they're just as real as your body parts. So um, it's not like just some kind of uh, abstract reasoning that we're talking about the possibility of a thought process or a model. There's really a temporal part of you in the future and the past for each moment at which you exist. Um, Okay, now, after that, he says, to really drive home even further the, the, the connection between time and space that is advanced by the space-time theory, he asks the reader to contemplate three general similarities between space and time according to the theory. One of those similarities was in terms of reality. That just was saying that no matter how far away an object is spatially, like no matter if it's close to you in your face or far away, it's still just as real. So, you know, the moon is far away from us right now, but it's real. And this computer that you're looking at this lecture on is real, and that's obvious to you because it's right in front of you. But even if it was on the moon, it would just be real too. So 
distance, proximity, in terms of space, that doesn't affect how real things are. The claim is that that's just the same with time. Moments that are present in time, like you, I hope, agree that this moment is real because you're experiencing it. But the idea is that moments that are far distant from this present are also just as real as this one is. Okay. The second similarity was in terms of parts. Basically just saying that objects take up space by having spatial parts, they take up time by having temporal parts, and both parts are real. And then the third similarity mentioned was in terms of the words here and now. That similarity is just about the idea that those are both relative terms. Neither of those terms has any objective meaning. The meaning of the term here or now depends on where or when the speaker uses the word. So if I say, um, you know, right here there's a cup of iced tea, that's true when I'm saying it, because here when I speak refers to my local surroundings. But if you're watching this lecture and you don't have any such glass of iced tea, then you might say, well, here there's no such thing. And we're both kind of correct because here doesn't have only one objective reference. It's referred to the context of the speaker. And that's the same with the word now. So if I say to you now it's 6.30, I mean, that's true relative to my current context of speech. But in an hour, if I say um, now the time is 7.30, that will also be true. So the present moment, whatever we're calling now, is just whenever the person says it. And the present place where here is, it's just wherever the speaker says it. So when and where the speaker speaks the words gives you the uh, reference of those relative indexical terms. Okay, so that's my summary. What, what I've done in the first 30 minutes of our class period today is just, first of all, welcome you guys back and say hopefully you're doing well. Number two, to go over the prompts for the essay that's due in three weeks. And then now just to re review the last week's meeting. Uh, of topics. But we have a little bit more on time. We have one more author that we didn't get to cover last week. So I'm going to spend, you know, probably maybe 30 minutes or so between now and seven getting clear with you guys on the work of David Lewis. Okay, so one more author on the topic of time that got pushed into today. So let's go over it now. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the philosopher that we're talking about right now is this guy, David Lewis. David Lewis is a great American philosopher of the uh, 20th century. He lived from 1941 until 2001. And, um, you know, he had a very uh, Im impactful career in the academy and in philosophy. Um, he wrote on so many interesting and very weird topics. He's kind of known as like a guy who is willing to um, stake out kind of obscure positions that might seem in a way outside of the mainstream, but he always provides these really good, very detailed arguments to back up his positions. So, you know, he's, he's willing to defend um, unorthodox, unusual philosophical claims. But by the time you always read his arguments, you come away from it thinking like, you know, maybe that's actually correct, as weird as it sounds, yeah. So he's good uh, in philosophy, had a great career. He taught at some elite institutions. Um, let me see, um, Princeton, UCLA, he, he taught in Australia also for a while. So in my mind, you know, he's one of my personal favorites of the previous century, and maybe just throughout philosophy, because I really like the contemporary writers that are still out there and that are working closer to the present day. Um, well, one of the things that he was interested in that he wrote about in this part of our class we're going to study is time. And uh, he wrote a paper that first he gave as a lecture when he was only 30. Uh, later on, when he was 35, it was published, and that's the paper we're going to discuss. So it's from 1976, and it's called um, The Paradoxes of Time Travel. <clears throat> Let me get this a bit marker here. The Paradoxes of Time Travel. Okay, so the space-time theory implies that all of space-time exists and um, space and time are integrated into one unified system or structure. Um, Ted Sider, at the end of his paper, he says some people might not like that theory because they just find it to be so weird, right? Like how weird is it to think that there's parts of you that exist in the future that are also just as real as the present part of you that's watching this lecture. Some people might say that can't be true. You know, I'm, I'm fully present in each moment that I exist, not just like one part of me is there. 
Or somebody might think it's weird that according to space-time theory, nothing really, really changes, you know, just the whole set of moments of the entire object's, object's existence are fully set out. So there's not so much change as difference of qualities of different temporal parts, right? Like, so I got a beard right now. If I shave this beard off, you might say I've changed my appearance. But in the space-time theory, well, that's not exactly correct because the part of me that had the beard was on the timeline all, all, all along. And the part of me subsequent to that that did not have the beard was also always on that same timeline at that position in the timeline. So is it really change? No. There's just all the moments, and what looks like change is actually just qualitative difference of different temporal parts. A deeper problem, though, that some find with space-time theory is that if space and time really are linked and so closely connected, then how come objects can't move backwards in time? Or how come objects uh, or events of the future or present cannot exert an influence or a causal influence on moments of the past? You'd think, right? Because, look, in space, you can move in any direction. An object can move forward diagonally, retrograde, or whatever. Uh, but you might say time's not like that. There's only one steady direction from past to the future, and only the past can influence the future, but not the other way around. Well, what Ted Sider and David Lewis say in response to those possible objections is that time travel, at least, just focusing on that last point for a moment, time travel, as weird as it may sound, is not actually theoretically inconceivable. Um, maybe it's just bizarre. Maybe it sounds very weird but it's not actually totally impossible. So that's David Lewis's thesis in this paper here. His basic uh, argument is in a way a simple one. It's just that time travel is possible. It's possible. It's not impossible. That's his whole goal in the paper to try and convince and show the reader that time travel uh, is logically possible. It, even if it's weird, the weird puzzling paradoxes of it do not uh, illustrate that it's impossible, just that it's strange. So now his goal, after having said that's my thesis, that time travel is possible, is to try and explain away what might be argued to be some of the paradoxes and contradictions of time travel. He has to show us that those are not really impossibilities. They're just strange aspects of the concept. Okay, so let's take a little trip down the rabbit hole as we try and think about time travel and the logical possibility of time travel. Okay, so David Lewis, Paradoxes of Time Travel. Let's go over it now. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to erase this so we can start going into more notes. So first of all, um, one possible paradox of time travel is built right into the whole concept of what it is. So um, let me give you this little picture to, to look at. Here's a person, this stick figure, right? Let's say this person walks into this cylinder. Okay, so they walk in the cylinder. When they walk in that cylinder, they look at their clock, which they have a watch on their wrist, and it says that it's uh, 9.55 a.m. Okay? So it says 9.55 a.m. when they walk in there, then they walk out. Okay? While they were inside this container, their clock said five minutes past. On their clock, it said five minutes past. So they spent five minutes in there relative to their clock. Okay. Now, when the person emerges from the cylinder, um, let's think about this question. What if all the clocks on all the walls and on everyone else's wrist all say 10 a.m.? Okay. When he gets out, his watch says 10 a.m., all the other watches say 10 a.m. too. In that case, did this man travel through time? If he walked into the cylinder, when he walked in, every watch, everywhere, every clock on every wall said 9.55, so did his watch on his wrist. He spent five minutes of his time in there, and then when he gets out, all the clocks say 10 a.m. of the same day. Would that mean that he traveled through time or no? Okay, good, Cher, you're saying no. And that's the right answer. In that case, did this man travel through time? Is this a time machine in that case? Well, no. In that case, this is like a shipping container, and you just stood in it for five minutes and then got out of it. Well, you know, that's not really time travel, is it? Or if it is, then we're all time travelers, I guess, but in a very boring sense. We're just time travelers traveling from the past to the future at the same rate, one hour per hour. Like, in that sense of time travel, fellow time travelers, we've just traveled through 39 minutes of time since this lecture started until now. But that's not what people talk about when they talk about time travel, right? They don't just talk about people just existing and time passing. 
They're talking about being able to zoom ahead or go way back in the past relative to everybody else. So for this person to be a time traveler, when he spends five minutes inside the uh, inside the cylinder, let me uh, let's let's go through one hypothesis. He steps out of the cylinder after five minutes passes on his watch. If he traveled through time two hours into the future, what should the clock say external to his watch on his wrist when he gets out of it? So here's the postulate. He traveled two hours ahead into the future. He got in there at 9.55. His watch said five minutes passed. Now he emerges. If this time traveling person went two hours into the future, what should the clock say on all the other walls when he gets out? This two hour into the future time traveler that spent five minutes of his own time in the machine. What should every other clock say? Uh, you say 11.55 basically. I was, gonna go, I was going for 12, right? Because there's the five minutes spent by him, but two hours additional added on top of that. Um, if he goes into the past, right? Then what should the watch say? Let's say if he goes um, eight hours into the past, then when he gets out, his clock on his wristwatch is gonna say that it's 10 because he spent five minutes of his own time inside of this cylinder. But if he goes eight hours into the past, then what should all the external clocks say when he emerges in that case? So you gave me the answer basically 12 noon if he went two hours to the future. If he goes eight hours to the past, the clocks should say instead, Sherry, we keep getting like five minutes off, 2 a.m., okay? Two minus is eight, is eight, 10 minus eight, okay? But anyway, basically correct. So for him to actually be a time traveler, there should be a discrepancy between the measurement of time that is on his own wristwatch and the external measurement of time all by all these outside clocks. So let's imagine that that did happen. Let me go with the, um, the two hour into the future hypothesis, okay? So he gets out after spending five minutes according to his watch in the cylinder. When he emerges, his clock says 10 a.m., but all the other clocks in the world say 12 noon. So this is kind of a tricky question I'm gonna ask you now. And this is setting up the first so-called paradox that Lewis wants to try and explain away. Question, how much time passes in between when this guy got in the machine and when he got out? And the reason I'm telling you it's kind of like a trick question is because there's two possible answers that both sound somewhat reasonable. So following my description, he gets in this machine at 9.55 a.m. according to his watch and all external watches. Five minutes of his time is spent in that machine, so when he gets out, his wristwatch says 10 a.m. But all the external clocks, they say 12 noon. How much time was there in between getting in and getting out of the machine? How much time separates arrival to the machine and departure from it? What's the interval? It's an amount of time, so what do you think it is? Between getting in and getting out. <clears throat> so, one way to look at it is that it's two hours and five minutes, yes. But another possible way to look at it is that there's how much time in between the two events. That's correct. That's one possible way of looking at it because if you were just an outside observer and you're not the time traveler, you would have seen him get in there at basically 9.55 and then you would have seen him emerge at noon. But it also seems like it's possible to say that he just spent five minutes in there, right? Because relative to himself, that's the amount of time he experienced. He got in there, spent five minutes, and when he gets out, it's two hours ahead for everybody else, but just five minutes for him. So what's the right answer? Is it five, hour, is it five minutes or is it two hours? It seems like it's a paradox because it, it looks like both. Um, and that's the first possible paradox of time travel. So let me put it up here. Possible paradox. How can the same two events be separated by, um, I'm going to erase this to give me a little more room. How can the same two events be separated by two different amounts of time? Okay, so that just seems like it's a very weird puzzle that is leading us to a contradiction and therefore maybe time travel is not possible. 
But David Lewis is going to try and explain how this is not really making the case that it is impossible. It's just strange. So back to our example. On the one hand, it looks like he got in there at 9.55 a.m., and he spent five minutes in there before he emerged. But viewed from a third-person perspective, he appears to get into the machine at 9.55 and then get out at 12 noon. So one way of answering the question, how much time separated entry to departure is five minutes and the other two hours. But already that just sounds like it's a bizarre impossibility. The same two events you would think in the ordinary course of affairs could not be separated by two different amounts of time. For example, what if you asked a person who just took a flight from New York to California? Hey, how long was the flight? Basically, you're asking them this. How much time was spent in the air between when you got takeoff and landing? What if they give you this strange answer? Oh, how long was the flight? Okay, well, it was uh, it was six hours. It was also two hours. So, I mean, that was how long it took. It was, it was six hours. Also, though, it was two. You look at the person like, what are you saying? That does not make sense. I asked you how long it took, but you gave me two different uh, answers. So it might seem like it's impossible for the same two events to be separated by different intervals of time. But David Lewis says, not so fast. This can actually be explained, okay? So what he says is, to eliminate this paradox, we have to introduce two different um, time frames, okay? So okay, so there's on the one hand what's called personal time, and on the other hand what's called external time. <clears throat> Okay, so personal time would be time as experienced and measured by the individual time traveler, as, as indicated on their personal wristwatch, which, which is attached to their body and traveling with them. So this is, again, time as experienced and measured by the individual time traveler. Okay, time as experienced and measured by the individual time traveler, but external time is a little different. External time would be time as measured and experienced by all external clocks and observers. Okay, so and observers. Okay, so maybe it's a little hard to read, so if it is, let me just add this in the comments here. Um, external time. Just in case that got a little crunched at the bottom, you'll see my written typed um, note there in the in the live chat. So okay, we've got two different time frames now: personal and external time. And once we utilize these two different ways of measuring and recording time, uh, the paradox gets dissolved. So go back to our example of uh, the guy that got in that cylinder at 9:55 a.m. And according to his watch, he spent five minutes in there. But when he got out, it seems that two hours have passed according to all the other clocks. Now, utilizing the concept of these two time frames, we can precisely explain what's going on. So there was five minutes of uh, what type of time that passed? 
<clears throat> he spent five minutes of blank time in the machine. Five minutes of this kind of time separated his departure and um, arrival from the machine. So it was five minutes of which of them? Let's see what you say. Yes, that's right. Five minutes of personal time, because that's the amount of time that he experienced relative to his own watch. But although it was just five minutes of personal time, it was two hours of, I'm going to wait for it. What's the other one? It's five minutes of personal time. But on the other hand, two hours of what? Yes, of external time, exactly, Gilberto, so, and Sherry, yes. So that now eliminates the appearance of a paradox. <clears throat> now you might think, how could there be two different time frames? Isn't personal time just the same as external time? So like an hour for me is the same as an hour for you and for everybody else. Well, yeah, because we're not traveling through time and we don't have the technological means to do it. But if there were time travel, by definition, this is what it would involve, a discrepancy between two different measurements of time. So. And also, it's fully licensed by the theory of relativity and space-time theory of Einstein. According to Einstein's theory, we actually all do occupy our own personal time frame. It's just that they never seem to diverge from each other, and they're all remaining in sync because we don't have the means to achieve such variable speeds to cause time dilation on any kind of significant level that's measurable. Um, but if we were able, to move around at close to the speed of light while other people stay at rest, then there would be huge discrepancies all the time between personal and external time, and people's watches would constantly be getting out of sync. Um, so this, in fact, is not a paradox at all. It's to be expected, and it's perfectly predicted by the Einstein theory of relativity that there is, in fact, a discrepancy between one person's frame of reference for time and then the larger frame of reference by others. Um, now, using that concept, we can make sense of what would appear to be puzzling or even contradictory expressions. What if time travel existed, right? And I said to you, um, I want to go back to 2016 to warn myself about the coronavirus and what's going to happen uh, in 2020. So <clears throat> maybe I say this to you as I head into the machine. Well, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to be back in 2016. That sounds like a paradox because it sounds like in 10 minutes of like time, I'm going to be four years in the past. How can time be going in two different directions? But now we can make sense of that statement. It is interpreted as follows. Um, in five minutes or whatever, 10 minutes of personal time, I will be minus four years in external time relative to the external observers and clocks. And in future time travel, say that I want to um, go ahead to, I don't know, 2025 um, to see who's president at that time. Um, so I say, well, you know, I got my time machine, so give me 15 minutes and I'll be in 2025. It sounds like I'm saying in 15 minutes I'll be five years in the future. But what really that does mean is that in 15 minutes of my personal time, as measured on my own watch, uh, I'll be five years ahead into the future relative to external time. Okay. So, hey, Cameron, good to see you. Um, hopefully your internet issues are resolved. I'm glad to have as many people here attending as possible. So there's one paradox of time travel that he's tried to dismiss. Through the notion of two different time frames, personal and external, it actually is no longer contradictory to say that two events can be separated by two unequal amounts of time because they can be separated by a different amount of personal versus external time. Okay, so now I'll erase that. And we're going to talk about the next paradox discussed by the author. <clears throat> okay. So, all right. Question. Let me just ask you this question. Think of like a time travel, you know, science fiction scenario. And think of a scenario where you or whoever is time traveling to the past goes back in time to have a conversation with your previous past self, okay? Like, so um, imagine that tomorrow the time machine comes out, you know, uh, Apple 
I, I time machine, right? 2020, new first version. And then um, you say, well, cool, I've got a time machine. So you think maybe I should go back to tell myself something in the past. Um, so you go back to like whatever, 2015, halfway through the last decade, and you want to, you know, just make a phone call to your, to your younger self. Maybe you want to tell them, I don't know, anything. Okay. So you go back in, in time and now you're in 2015. You from 2020 go back to that time. Now you're talking to yourself five years ago. Uh, question, how many people do you think would be on that phone call uh, that you're making when you communicate with your previous self? Is it two people or is it one? That's my question. How many people are engaged in the phone conversation when you take a trip to the past or the future, but we're going with the past, take a trip to the past and you talk to your past self. If you like it in the other direction, whatever, going to the future, talking to your future self. You want to, you want to see what you ended up doing with your life. So you go to like 2040 and see how things are going for your future self and you place a phone call to them in the year 2040, but this is your 2020 self zooming ahead. Uh, okay. So Maria and Sherry, you're throwing out the case of two people. Why do you think two? Why are you giving me that answer? What's your reason, though? Why do you think it's two? Danny, you're saying two also. Gilbert, it seems like everybody thinks it's two. I'm going to tell you it's not, though. It's one, so you're all wrong, but whatever. Why do you think it's two? <clears throat> well, okay, you're saying different temporal parts, but let's be clear, Sherry. Two temporal parts are not two people. Two temporal parts are two parts of what? Can you finish that sentence? Two temporal parts of an object... They're two parts of the same object, okay? So what the right way to analyze this is to say that that's actually two different temporal parts of the same person. Now, I don't want to make it seem like too ridiculous, the assessment that it's two people, because there's common sense behind that, right? To all external observers watching this phone call, it would appear to all appearances that's two people. you got a caller that sends the call and another caller that receives the call, and they're in two different complete parts of space. Um, but Maria, though they're separate beings in one time, they're two temporal parts of the same being in the same part of space. So like here, let me show you on a diagram. <clears throat> you know what, here, let's see, is this other marker here, the blue one? All right, let me use the blue one for a minute. <clears throat> so like say here is a space-time diagram. And the person was born in 2000. Then in 2020, they decided, so here's their space-time diagram, marching forward to the future. But in 2020, they make a decision, you know what, I want to go back and place a call to myself in 2016. So you do that. Here's the 2016 hash mark in the timeline. So this person, at this point, zigzags back into the past. All right, now, they make the phone call, and then they decide, okay, that's cool, I'm done, I'm going back to 2020. Now, in this part of the time uh, diagram, if you were to cut a cross-section, you cut a cross-section through the space-time worm, and you just get one part, that one individual part. But if we cut a cross-section through 2016 now, how many temporal parts are there in that part of space-time at once? You can see by means of the vertical cross section how many temporal parts of there of the same being in 2016 now because they took the return trip to 2016 and went to the past. Can you see it on the graph? Hopefully so. Give me the answer. How many temporal parts are located in the same part of space in 2016? See the cross section. You see it cutting through this worm like little squiggle. Yeah, there's two, right? There's two here. So there's the initial temporal part in the timeline of their existence from 2016, but then, you know, their personal time continues. And then there's the second later on stage of them that's also present in 2016. Now me and you, because we don't go back in time, right? In our space time diagram, there just be this slow and steady march to the future, eventually cut off by death. But if we did zigzag back in time, we're talking about time travel, right? So if actually people went back into the past, then yes, the previous stage of their existence would already be there in the past. And the stage of them that's making the trip back would also be there by hypothesis of the fact that they're going back in time. 
Now suppose that when you get back to 2020, you're like, wait a minute, oops, I left my AirPods back in 2016. I don't want those to be back there because maybe someone will discover them and be like, what is this stuff? It doesn't even exist yet. Plus, they're nice and I want to keep them. So you're like, well, you got to get back in the machine again, take another quick trip back, and get those AirPods again. Okay, and then I'll go back to 2020 again. Now, if that happens, how many temporal parts of the individual are in 2016 now? Now there's three because there's been another trip back. So you've got the first individual in their original 2016 experience, the person making the initial trip back, and then the even subsequent stage of them later on. Now notice how their entire streak is one continuous streak, but we see the co-location of multiple temporal parts in the same part of space-time when we draw the cross-section through. So uh, you're talking about a phone call. Yes, it is a phone call, but like, I mean, think about it. Like, put yourself in this position, can you? I'm gonna send you in a time machine tonight to the beginning of the semester. You're gonna go back and you're gonna tell Sherry on day one, this is gonna be a cool class. You never learned anything like this. Just pretending, right, whatever. Not necessarily saying you believe that. But you're gonna go back there, okay? So when you make the phone call, you make a phone call to your past self. The other person on the other end of the line picks up the phone. That's you picking up the phone back in January. And you, from later on in the year, after the COVID outbreak, are coming back to talk to that previous part of your own self. So I don't know how to interpret your question. It is a phone call, but it's two temporal parts because you know, you're going back in time, you're not calling them from the future. You're calling them in 2016, like on a landline or whatever, cell phone, like anybody does. Okay, so yes, the right explanation then of this paradox. So Lewis says, is this a paradox? Is it two people and one? It seems like it's both. He says, no, the correct answer is that it's just one person, but it's two temporal parts. And he gives a further reason as to why that's the best explanation, okay? If it was actually two separate people, there would be no mental connection between the two of them. Like if I call you on the phone, we're two different people, and I have no memories of being you, right? But if, if I'm talking to my younger self in the past, then I actually do have a psychological connection to that previous part of myself, and I can remember being the younger self receiving the phone call. Okay, so there's psychological continuity among the different stages in the temporal stages of the individual's life. That would make it very clear that it's actually the same person, because if it was two different people, then you would not have memories um, derived from the other temporal parts experiences, you see? Um, another thing, right? If this temporal, like, so say that you like lost a finger or something in 2016, you still don't have that finger when you come back having made the return trip after 2020. So there's also like causal connection between the different temporal parts, which gives us the reason to think that they're just one person in the same connected system. Because when you have two different people, right, if one person on the phone call doesn't have a finger, that doesn't cause the other person on the other end of the phone call to also not have a finger. But of course, if it's your past self, you're going to have continuity with whatever features were exhibited by the previous temporal part. So there's gonna be psychological continuity of memory. And then there's also going to be physiological continuity of the body. So like traits are carried over and you still resemble the person and all those other things, right? So these are all very good reasons per se to think that it's just one person, but two temporal parts. Why don't we ever have more than one temporal part in the world at a given time? Because we're not time travelers or at least we think, right? Maybe your future time traveling self is in 2020 right now. And you know, you just don't see them or recognize them because they're much older looking and they've chosen not to interact with themselves because maybe they're worried about creating paradoxes or something. I don't know, just throwing it out there. Okay, so next paradox to be explained away. <clears throat> uh, so I'm just gonna talk you through this next one a little bit because it's kind of just easier to do, I think. Um, it has to do with the concept of closed loops of causation, of cause and effect. So um, <clears throat> take this hypo hypothetical scenario, all right? You get a phone call. Let's say you get a phone call uh, tonight after the lecture. And this phone call, you're like, who is this person? It sounds kind of randomly like me, but that doesn't make sense. Who is this? Anyway, you take the phone call. And the person on the other end of the line says, okay, great, I got you on the phone. I just need you to do something for me. Don't ask questions. Just please follow these directions. I need you to build something. I have the directions that I'm going to give you here by the phone 
and you need to follow these directions like a blueprint and build a machine. And you're like, but who are you again? And what's the machine? They're like, don't worry about that. I'm just telling you, it's important. Do it. So you're like, fine, I guess. You took the phone call, you heard their directions, and you built some type of machine based on the directions. Now, let's say you let this machine just kind of collect dust. You leave it in your garage. Like, man, what is that thing that this person had me build? A mysterious phone call where they told me to build this thing. I wonder if I should ever turn it on. Finally, you're like four years from now, like, all right, whatever. Let me do that. I'll turn it on. So you turn it on. You realize it's a time machine. Wow. So you get into it. Now it's 2024. And you make a choice. You're like, I'm going to actually go back to 2020. And when I go back to 2020, I'm going to make sure that this one thing happens. What do you think? is the next step of this little science fiction scenario. So follow the story, you got a call. The caller said, build this machine. Don't ask why, just do it. So you do. Four years later, you use the machine. It turns out to be a time machine and you send yourself back to 2020. And when you go back to 2020, your whole thought process is, I'm gonna go back and do what? Can you fill in the blank? What do you think would be the next little twist in this plot? Let's see if you can put it together. Go ahead, let me know. What are you doing going back to 2020 now? It's a question, I'm, I'm waiting for an answer, so tell me the answer, if you can hear me. <clears throat> Dead silence, is that really real? Is that what's happening right now? Come on, give me an answer. Let me, you want me to repeat myself? Okay, so you get a phone call tonight. The phone call person says, hey, make this machine. You do, based on the instructions given. Time passes. It's four years from now. You get in this machine, and it's a time machine, and you think, I'm going to go back to 2020. Okay, I'm going back to 2020, so when I go back to 2020, I can do what? Now, Maria, you wrote the words, the machine. I'm sorry, but I don't quite understand. Can that be a complete sentence? You're going back to 2020 to do what? to do, I'm going back to 2020 in order to what? You guys watch movies? I mean, come on, if this was a film, I think for sure you'd know exactly what it is. Uh, so, Gilberto, you're trying to say don't answer the phone, but I don't understand. You're not going to receive a call in the past because it's your previous past self that receives the phone call. Okay, Angelina, you're talking about to build the time machine. That's getting right along the right lines. Okay, so uh, let me just spell it out for you, all right? You've got this phone call tonight from a mysterious phone caller. Who do you think that person is? Keep that in your mind anyway. So you get this phone call. The person says build a machine. Time passes four years. You get in the machine, and you're like, I'm going back to 2020 because I need to go back to 2020 so I can make a phone call to who? You're going back to 2020 so that you can place a phone call to what person? Yes, to place a phone call to the past self and tell that person, you, yourself, you're gonna tell your previous younger self how to build the time machine, right? You're doing that because you remember receiving the call and all you knew was that this phone call led you to create the machine. Now that you have created it based on the information provided in the call, you're going back to pass the information along to your past self so that the machine will be built by yourself in that past, okay? So it's a loop, everybody. Can you understand that this is a loop? How did you find out how to make the machine in this scenario that we're giving? You originally found out to make the machine because you received the call, okay? That's where you got the information from and that's what led you to build the machine. Now. How do you know how to tell the person, your younger self, how to build the machine? Well, you know how to tell them because you remember receiving the information when you were younger. But the question now is kind of deep and weird. Where did the information come from in the first place to build the machine? If you just focus on each individual link of the story, the individual parts make sense, but the big picture kind of is mind boggling, right? Like if you just ask, where did I get the information from? From a phone call, okay, no problem. But if you ask why was the phone call placed, then that takes us back to, well, the phone call was placed in an effort to pass the information along that you already received from your past experience. But where did the information come from? It seems like it's kind of just, you know, bubbling up out of nowhere and it's completely incomprehensible how the information ever came into being. Now, some people say this is a paradox. 
let me look at some of your comments here. Uh, Gilberto, you say, isn't the time machine already built? Well, it's not built in 2016 until the person builds it. Are you confusing the two different years? It's built by the time of 2020. But when you use it to go back to 2016, it hasn't yet been built because it doesn't exist until the guy builds it. And he doesn't even get started until after the phone call. So if you go back to the time before the phone call was made, because you're going to make it for the first time, then no, there's no machine that yet exists. The machine exists in the future of the individual, but not in the 2016 that you're going back to in order to tell them. Um, are you stuck in a loop forever then? Well, no, Maria, because again, you have to remember that the present moment's not the only moment that exists. So all the moments outside of 2020 that go into 2021, 2022, and on and on, all those moments also equally well exist. You must be thinking about it in terms of like going in a circle, um, becoming the younger person again. No, uh, it's like that loop again. It's sorry, it's like that zigzag streak. So 2020, back here when the person was born, 2000. Here's 2016. At the point of 2020, they go back to 2016. Okay, to place the phone call. But then after they get back in the time machine and go back to 2020, they just continue on for the remainder of the timeline. So they're not actually stuck in a loop. But if you ask yourself about the genesis of the time travel blueprint, that does seem like it's caught up in some kind of loop that we can't possibly analyze. Now, how does Lewis get away from this puzzle? Well, what he basically says, this I don't know if is I don't know if this is the most satisfying response that he has to all these paradoxes. But what he says here is basically this. Um, yeah, it's weird and puzzling, but it's not anything impossible because it's not any stranger or more weird than other things that we already accept about the universe. For example, has this universe always existed or did it come out of nothing? Okay, either answer that you give is just totally mind boggling and mind blowing. If it's been here forever, then it has no beginnings at all. What kind of thing has no beginnings? I mean, that's just hard to understand or fathom. On the other hand, if it was created out of nothing or if it emerged out of nothing, like the Big Bang, that's something coming out of nothing. And that seems to violate, you know, fundamental laws of physics, the conservation of matter and all of that. Um, or take God, right? Suppose you say, oh, God's the answer to all that. God just brings it into being. But of course, we've talked about the difficulties in trying to understand, well, then what's God? God's something that doesn't have an explanation, just ultimately exists, and we can't inquire into the reasons why. So what he says is, you know, the infinite past of the universe or a creation out of nothing or the idea of God, those are concepts that are just as mind-boggling as this loop that we're talking about concerning time travel. So he says, don't say that that's literally impossible or inconceivable. It's no more or less inconceivable than the universe that we're already a part of which is just as strange and weird as talking about these closed loops. So here, let me read about it. We can hear maybe Lewis put it his own way. <clears throat> okay. Okay, yeah, so here's a, the, the passage on 469 to 70. He says, recall the time traveler who talked to himself. He talked to himself about time travel. And in the course of the conversation, the older self told the younger self how to build a time machine. That information was available in no other way. The older self knew because the younger self had been told and the information had been preserved by memory. The younger self knew after the conversation because the older self had known the information and passed it along by giving testimony. But where did the information come from in the first place? Why did the whole thing happen? There's simply no answer. Um, the parts of the loop make sense, but the whole thing does not. Strange, but not impossible, and not too different from inexplicabilities that we're already used to. Almost everyone agrees that God or the Big Bang or the entire infinite past of the universe is inexplicable. So if those are possible, then why not also the inexplicable causal loops that could arise in a time travel scenario? Okay, so... Uh, if you want to see one case of like a really funny or I don't know, I shouldn't say funny, it's not humorous, but a really kind of interesting and trippy uh, loop of this kind, um, that would have been the film that I was going to show at this part of the class, Time Crimes. So I don't know, I mean, just for your own entertainment and fun, if you like science fiction and film, I think that's a really good one. And the whole plot line of the movie is exactly based on such a loop like this. Um, so anyway, that's his response that, yeah, it's weird, but it's not any more or less contradictory than say 
the infinite past of the universe, or take another hypothesis, the beginning of the universe out of nothing, or shifting the uh, contradiction to the question of what God is like. How could God exist without any ultimate explanation or cause? Okay. So then there's this one last paradox of time travel that the author does talk about, and I want to make sure we cover that and then we move on. So, oh, good. I'm glad that you liked it. So then you would know about these loops, Sherry, actually, um, because right in the movie, um, Hector is trying to, um, let's say, he goes into the woods. Well, you guys have not all seen it, but Sherry, we could talk about it another time just for like two seconds. He goes in the woods in the first place because he's drawn into the woods by a person that's forcing a woman to undress. Um, but then when he gets there, he gets stabbed in the arm and chased into a time machine. After he gets in the time machine and he goes back in time a little bit, he realizes that he himself is the assailant who stabbed himself in the arm earlier. And he also realizes that he has to hold this woman captive in order to lure himself into the forest so that he can affect their escape into the time machine. Blah, blah, blah. There's a lot more. I guess I could tell you guys. But uh, it's a good film. And the concept of such a causal loop is, is exactly the plot. It's a consistent and very well-crafted time travel scenario. So I'm not spoiling it much, but there's some interesting stuff that follows after that. Okay, well, here we go. One more of these issues in this paper of Lewis. Um, yeah, <laughs> sorry for that. No spoilers, but I mean, what can I do? I gotta connect something to um, the world of art and literature and film to make it a little bit easier to understand. Okay. So I'm going to tell you guys a little science fiction story that, about time travel that Lewis uses in this paper. This has become a famous concept in uh, the metaphysics of time. And nowadays, they just call it by the grandfather paradox because it's so well known from his original essay. OK, so I want you to imagine there's a guy named Tim. I don't know if Tim was chosen because Tim sounds like time, but whatever. Tim. Tim is a person who hates his grandfather. Like he hates his grandfather with a burning passion. And um, what he would like to do more than anything else in this world would be to commit murder and kill his grandfather. Okay, He wants to take his grandfather out. But there's a little problem, though, because his grandfather's already dead. So, I mean, you might be thinking, Tim is really messed up, man. Why does he want to kill a person that's already passed away? Well, he does, all right? That's just how he is. He hates his grandfather. I don't know why, but he has a passionate hatred against him. And he wants to – he doesn't just – he's not satisfied with the fact that he died because he died of natural causes. He wants to be the person that murdered him. He wants to be the cause of his death. He doesn't just want it to be something that happened on its own. So he has a plan. He actually inherited a ton of wealth from his grandfather, uh, and he uses that same wealth to build a time machine. And here's what he's doing. With the inherited wealth that built the time machine, he's going to go back to, like, 1950, and he's going to go back to 1950 armed and prepared to kill his grandfather back when he was in his prime years. Okay, so he's, he's got a mission on, on his mind. I'm traveling to the past to kill my freaking grandfather that I hate. Um, and I'm going to do this at a time in his life when he's still kind of young and in his prime. But think about it. If he was to actually succeed here and kill the grandfather, what he would do is kill the grandfather before he ever uh, fathered the parent, one of the two parents of this person named Tim. So if he eliminates and executes his grandfather back in 1950, then he basically – would have prevented the occurrence of his own birth. All right, so I got a question. Can Tim kill his grandfather or not? Is it possible or is it not possible for him to succeed in killing his grandfather back in 1950 when he goes back into the past? What do you think? Can he or can't he? Is it possible or is it impossible um, for him to kill the grandfather? Now, I, I mean, I guess I should try and be a little bit um, you know, open about this because the answer is not necessarily like it's both answer, two different types of answers seem equally reasonable or to some extent reasonable, but let's try and go through both. So one way of looking at it is that, what do you think? Could he or could he not? Okay. So you guys, Sherry, Maria, you're saying, no, he could not. And that's basically right. He's not going to be able to change the past because if he succeeded in this, then that would contradict uh, the timeline, right? That would mean that the person who committed the murder was never born, but that's not possible, right? If he's there in the past able to do anything, then clearly he was born. And so the events that led to his birth cannot possibly be canceled or annulled, not in the same universe. It cannot be that he both was and also wasn't born. Like think about your own existence, okay? Now, were you born at some point in time? Of course. 
Do you think there's any way that we can delete that fact? Like as though this is a big computer program and oops, you never were born. That just never happened. No. I mean, you're already part of the universe. You're already part of space time. So the temporal parts that constitute your being, they're just out there and those things can't cease to exist or be erased. So one way of looking at it is no, of course he can't do it because that would be contradiction. But, you know, uh, Lewis plays around with the other side of the uh, response. He says, well, some might say, yeah, he can't because it looks like he can because he's in the past, because he's got a rifle, because he's trained, because he's got the means and the motivation. Why shouldn't he be able to do, it? you know, what's to stop and kind of thought process? It's not like, you know, guardians of time are going to swoop down and like intercept the bullet or something. So one might think it looks like on that way of looking at it, he can do it. OK, so what's Lewis's answer? David Lewis says that the most reasonable interpretation that keeps everything consistent is that, no, he actually cannot do that. He's not going to be able to do it. Uh, it doesn't mean that he can't attempt to do it. But ultimately, he's bound to fail. He's destined to fail uh, because we already know how the story unfolds and we already have the benefit of hindsight. We know that the grandfather does not, in fact, die in 1950, that he survives on for many years, ends up having a child and ends up becoming the grandfather of Tim. So he won't be able to succeed. But when he fails in his attempt, it's not necessarily going to be for any kind of weird, spooky reason. It's probably just going to be for a basic reason. His gun will jam. He'll miss the target at the last minute. The grandfather, like Mr. Magoo or something, will pick up the newspaper and the bullet will whiz over his head. Maybe he'll have a case of mistaken identity. But whatever does happen, we know that it can't result in the elimination of the conditions that lead to the birth of Tim. Now... There's an interesting final point I want to make about this, and this is something that Lewis says to close that essay. He says, in a way, the ambiguity about whether he can or can't succeed in killing his grandfather has to do with an ambiguity built right into the meaning of the word can. And Maria, you're saying, so technically you can't change the future from the past. Um, I think what you mean is you can't change the past from the future. And yes, that would be, that that would be true. According to the space-time theory, nothing can change. Everything's already there. So everything that can happen is already a part of space-time, and there's not two different possible outcomes to any ordering of events. So, um, so like if I went into the past, there's no way that let's say I could like kill John Lennon in 1965 before uh, before Sergeant Pepper's and Abbey Road and all that, because we already have those albums, and those albums are already part of the universe. So, um, you know, I can't be this time traveler that changes the past and makes it so that he didn't get assassinated in 1980, but instead at an earlier date. Um, that's a correct statement. Yes, it's not possible to alter events uh, because the events of space time are set out in temporal moments, which cannot be further subdivided or uh, erased. But about this ambiguity in the word can, David Lewis says there's actually two senses of the same word can. Okay, two senses of the word can. Two senses or two meanings of the one word, can. Okay, so there is the narrow sense, and then there's the broad sense. <clears throat> okay, so the narrow sense of the word can just refers to what one can do uh, given a more limited, narrower set of factors or facts. Okay, so what one is able to do based on a narrower range of facts. And then the broad sense of the word can is what one is able or capable of doing based on a more inclusive, broader set of facts. So what one is able to do based on a broader range or set of facts. Okay. Now, returning to our question, what can Tim do? Can he kill the grandfather or can he not do it? Lewis says that in a sense, we can kind of have it both ways. 
depending on the sense of the word can that we're employing. Now, to make this a little more relatable to you, let me ask you a question that's asked in the essay by Lewis to illustrate this concept. Um, if I ask you this question, what do you think would be your most you know, straightforward answer? I'm asking you, can you speak Russian? You, can you? What would you say if someone asked you that? I'm, I guess I'm asking you that, so what do you say to me? Can you speak Russian? Yes or no, can you? What do you think would be, uh, I mean, it's you, uh, so you would be able to tell me, right? Can you speak Russian? Okay, so you're saying no. All right, I see a bunch of no's, and I understand what you mean, but um, <clears throat> let me ask it in a different way, and maybe now I might get a different way of responding. Okay, if I compare you to like a cat, can you speak Russian compared to a cat? And what do you think the answer to that would be? if you just gave me your, your own common sense. In comparison to a cat, can you, the person that you are, speak Russian? What do you think about that? Cat, dog, you know, some other animal that's not a person like a human. Yeah, so you can speak Russian if I'm comparing you against a dog, but when I asked you the question in the first place and I said, can you speak Russian, you said no. Okay, so let's think about the different answers that we've given. When you say that you can't, when you say, no, I can't speak Russian, what facts about yourself are you looking at? Just certain facts, like for example, what? It's, it's abundantly obvious, but we want to make it very clear. So what's the reason you would tell a person that you say you cannot speak Russian in, in your first response when you said no? What did you mean? You meant, I'm saying no because these are the facts about me, that as of today, as you're pointing out, Sherry, that as of today, April 23rd, 2020, you've not yet studied it. You've not yet, let's say, um, embarked on a course of study to become fluent in the language. You don't know the vocabulary, um, and so you can't speak it today. But when I ask you, in a, in a comparison with you against, let's say, a dog or a cat, can you speak Russian? You said yes. Now, what facts about you are you thinking of when you say yes when I asked the question in that way. The first answer, no, was based on what you said to me, that you, today you have not learned about it yet. You have not yet you know, taken on the study of it. But when I compare you to a dog and you say, yes, I can in that case, now what are you saying about yourself? What are the facts about yourself that make you say yes when the question is phrased in the other way? It's about what you're capable of learning, right? So basically you, a human being, have the innate ability to acquire another language you know, if you really wanted to take it seriously and put in the work. So you can speak Russian, given what you're capable of doing. A dog can't speak Russian, no matter how much work it wanted to put in. But if I focus just on the narrower facts about you, not that you're a human being, have the ability to learn language, but if I just zero in on the immediate fact that you've not yet studied it, then I would answer, no, I can't, or you can't. So... What's the answer? Can you or can't you? Well, we get it both ways. In the narrow sense, no, you can't. Because in that case, we're just looking at your immediate circumstances. But in the big picture sense, like you're a human after all, in that sense, yes, you can. Okay, so now going back to Tim. When we said that Tim, when we asked the question, can he kill his grandfather, right, in this science fictional time travel scenario, can he kill his grandfather? Well, when you say, seems like he can, that's where you're just tunneling in on the narrow sense of the word, because you're just looking at the fact that he's there after all, and he's got a gun and he wants to use it to kill his grandfather, so what should stop him? But when you say, no, he can't, that's when you take a step back and you look at the bigger picture and you say, well, inevitably he's destined to fail, because although he wants to do it, he won't be capable of succeeding because we already know that his birth is an event that ends up happening later on in time. So in the broad sense of the word, he can't do anything to change the past. In the narrow sense, you might say he can because it appears that he can, given his means and his motive. Um, and this is, at the end of the day, where I find uh, the most interesting metaphysical connection to, to your life and my life by studying this material on time. Because, okay, like when you study philosophy class and they're talking to you about time like I am, I know some people might be, isn't this so weird? I mean, how far away from everyday life and 
normal stuff that we really care and worry about could this possibly be? Because we can't travel through time. And so isn't this just totally esoteric, you know, mental masturbation or something? But no, in fact, I think that there's something really deep and real that you can gain an insight into just by thinking through these uh, scenarios. So, all right, um, if the space-time theory is true, that means every moment of space-time is fully real, not just the present, but the full content of the future and past. It's all there in space-time, and all those moments are equally real, not just this one. Okay, so if that's the case, let me ask you a question. You're watching this lecture right now on some device or some computer screen, right? So that's what you're doing at this point in time. But let me ask you this. Do you think that it that you could have not watched this lecture tonight, even though you are? Do you think that it would be possible that you could have somehow not been watching this right now? Do you think that that would be possible or that that was possible? Could you have missed the lecture tonight? I know you're watching it by definition of seeing and hearing me, but could you have not watched it? What would you think about that question? Could you have missed this meeting tonight or this lecture? Could that have happened? Shauna, Gilberto, you're saying yes. Okay, so when you're saying that you could not have, that there, there is a possibility you could have missed this lecture, what do you mean? That you could have like what? Like what, what could have happened um, such that you wouldn't be watching this lecture? You are watching it, but we're going into a possibility, a hypothetical, like why are you saying that you might have missed it or that you could have missed it? How, how could that have possibly happened? That you weren't watching the lecture, slept in, watched a movie, yeah, you know, did something else with your evening or maybe just, you know, forgot about it. You're thinking about those things that could have happened, right? But they didn't, obviously. But now I want you to think about things from the framework of the whole space-time theory, okay? If you understand this space-time theory and what it implies about the nature of the universe, then isn't there a way of looking at it where there's no way that you could possibly have missed this lecture? And that's true. Why do you think somebody would say that if space-time theory is correct, then there's no way that you could be missing this lecture right now. Let me see, Sherry, you say this. I say no because the fact that I'm watching it means I wouldn't have missed it unless I traveled back in time and prevented it. Um, no, but you wouldn't be able to prevent it either, Sherry. Come on. We've talked about the scenario of going back, but you can't change what already happened. So you wouldn't prevent anything. But you sort of had a correct intuition in the first part of what you were saying. If the space-time theory is correct, then why do you say that according to that analysis of reality, no, you could not have missed this lecture. This was inevitably going to happen, and there's no other way that things could have possibly played out. Why do you think one could argue that this moment we're having right now could not have been avoided? It's not possible for you to have missed this lecture. Why do you think someone might say that? Put the pieces together. Space-time theory, what it implies about objects and their existence. Why would you then think, if that theory is correct, that the correct answer is no, you couldn't be missing this lecture. Okay, because the past, present, and future are all real, so it cannot play out any other way. Exactly, Sherry. Is this event happening right now? Yes, it's happening. You're watching me. It's not a dream. And so that means that this is part of your timeline of existence, right? One temporal part of you is watching this lecture right now. But if the space-time theory is correct, it means that it's not just the present moment that exists. This part of your existence on the timeline of your whole existence has always been there, waiting for this temporal part to experience it. So given the fact that you're watching this lecture, you have to be watching this lecture. And in the bigger picture, this is where it gets very deep and mind boggling and I think trippy, because it means that if space-time theory is correct, then you really can't do anything except for what? You will never be able to do anything, you will never be able to take any actions at all, except for which ones? The only things that you will ever, ever be able to do are the what things. You're right on the right track, Sherry, so maybe you could tell me. Spa according to space-time theory, with all the temporal parts in space and time fully laid out and fully existing, equally real, uh, the only actions you can ever do are the things you're destined to do and what's already determined, exactly. So this is part of your destiny because, look, it's happening. Uh, therefore, we're joined by destiny to have this lecture on time, I guess, if this theory is correct. And you never could have avoided it. Um, in fact, it's just as much something that can't be changed as the past. Can you go back and change what you did last year? No. But you also can't change what's happening now, and you can't change anything that will happen later because it's already all there. So isn't that strange? It starts to really tear at your whole notion of free will and the concept of the person having an open future. In your everyday way of thinking about life, I know that you think 
what happens next is totally up to me. If I want to do something, I'll do it. If I don't, I won't. But there's no fact about what's going to happen because it's undetermined and it's not yet real. But on the space-time theory, you have to kind of completely erase that way of thinking. All the moments of future time are just as real as this present moment is, and there's no difference in terms of how things will play out. So you're kind of, according to this view, just an observer of the order of events in your life. But there's no way you're going to be able to get off that track to see an alternative. And this is where I find, uh, as a philosophy professor, that the intuitions of students kind of get all crossed up. Because in the beginning of a class like this, when I talk to you about contingent truth, and I say to you, you know, take, for example, the outcome of the Super Bowl. Uh, that's contingent because it could have played out a different way, right? And sometimes students will, like, shrug and be like, what do you mean it could have happened a different way, like in a different possible world? But this is the actual world where it happened the one way. So what do you mean it could have happened different? Like, you kind of almost intellectually resist the idea of contingency. But now when we talk about space time and I tell you, no, you're locked into one course of events and there's no way anything else can happen. Now you're the person that's talking about, hey, what about the hypothetical case of me oversleeping this lecture? What about the hypothetical case of me, you know, having an emergency and wouldn't have been able to watch it? But what are these hypotheticals? They're not real. This is the real actual world where you're watching this lecture. So when you're dreaming up these alternative counterfactuals in your mind, they're purely mental constructs. Why would you think that there's anything else that could happen besides the events that are happening? Um, and so I find it's interesting, you know, on the one hand, when you first get introduced to contingency, you kind of feel like, no, there's only the actual world. This contingent stuff sounds kind of like it's fake. But then when I tell you that there's no way for you to change events and that, you know, your destiny is fully set and so good luck to you, you're like, no, I have free will because think of all the possibilities of me doing otherwise. You can't ever prove that you're capable of acting otherwise than you actually act because the things that you ever do are just the actual things that you do. They're never the counterfactual things. So like, I mean, here's an eraser, it's in my hand. I'm gonna do one of two things. I'm gonna either set it down like this or I'm gonna drop it. Which one is it? I'm free, right? Maybe I'll just put it on Kitty's back, right there, oh, it fell off. Now look, I thought I was doing something spontaneous. I thought I was doing something right there that like, you know, came out of nowhere, came out of left field, right? That wasn't supposed to happen. But you can't prove that, right? You can't show me a different course of actual events in which the choice that I just made to put this marker on her back or eraser didn't happen. So you see, um, it's very deep and heady, isn't it? It really does start to make you think about what the nature of personhood and free will is. But, uh, but that's about it for time, everybody. I kind of wanted to finish up the work of David Lewis. It's, an, it's a you know, detailed article with some interesting examples laid out. So again, what I'm telling you then is, forget time travel for a minute. Even if you're not a time traveler, you're just as much unable to change the future as Tim is able to change the past. So if that's true, it's really a weird way to think about life. Um, you're just kind of only having the illusion of free will and the illusion of contingency. But maybe there could still be contingency because of the logical possibility of outcomes that are different from these, but they're not factual outcomes. They're just mere mental constructs. Okay, so we've completed our discussions of time. And, uh, I'm going to erase this then, and we'll go on to the next thing. Good kitty. Hi, kitty. She really wonders what's going on. She's constantly getting involved in these lectures. Good girl, come on. All right. <clears throat> so next topic. We're moving ahead. So we've covered a lot of ground in this class, but we're moving into something new now. Um, so if I just review for you the first couple of subjects we've covered, we started the semester with the philosophy of uh, religion, questions concerning the existence of God and arguments on either side, whether he exists or doesn't. Um, we looked at ethics for a while, you know, the theory of morality, what makes an action right or wrong, ethically speaking. Um, then we studied epistemology, right, the theory of knowledge. What does it take to know something? What's the definition of knowledge? Uh, what's the difference between the classical Greek definition and uh, the criticisms that were formed later about it? And now we just wrapped up the whole topic of time and metaphysics of time. You know, what is time? What's the most current understanding of it? Um, as weird as this stuff is in the philosophy of time that I've been discussing, it's all exactly what the contemporary physics tells us. Um, it's the consensus view of working theoretical physicists, and there's it, definitely experimental and empirical support for it all. Uh, so it's weird to think about how 
that is the state of the art in terms of our understanding of time, the block universe where all the moments are fully laid out. And so we had a couple of interesting discussions about that, how it's different from classical ways of thinking about time where it's just linear and there's just the present. And then uh, talking about the puzzles and paradoxes of time travel and the difficulties analyzing the concept of time moving. Okay, so now we're on to a new subject in philosophy and just as I've said many times, there's a bunch of them. This is another big one, and this is the philosophy of mind. Okay, so for the remainder of tonight and then a good part of la uh, next week, we're going to talk about the philosophy of, of mind. <clears throat> okay, philosophy of mind, you see written right there. So we're introducing this topic. This is a new subject. This is a subject in philosophy which is all interested and concerned with the nature of consciousness, okay? Consciousness, thought, perception, experience, the inner life of the mental, the mind. What is that all about? What is the mind? How is it possible for us to have consciousness? And what's the nature of consciousness? Is consciousness something that's simply a physical phenomenon produced by the activity of the brain? Is there more to consciousness than the brain? Uh, is it somehow maybe spiritual or like the existence of the soul is what really gives us the ability to perceive and think and judge or is it merely physical? So whenever we start to really open up that conversation, where, how do we understand consciousness and is it something that's just physical or not? Those are questions that are of interest in the philosophy of mind. So I'm just going to put what some of the big basic questions are in this topic. So here are some of the big questions. Okay, so one question is um, the mind and the brain. Are they two different things or are they the same thing? Question. Are the mind and the brain two separate things or are they the same thing? So, question, deep, important question that we're going to try and tackle a little bit. Um, so what is the mind? Is it just the brain or no? Is it just the physical brain or, or are there two different things going on? Some people think that the mind is only the brain. It's just the neurological functioning of the brain that produces consciousness. So the neurons and synapses firing and doing their thing in your skull, that's the whole basis of consciousness, and there's nothing more to it than that. But some people say that there's the physical body and the brain, but separate to that, like a mind, which is a philosopher's term for maybe what a theologian would call a soul or a spirit. So the mind, <clears throat> when it's discussed as something separate from the brain, is usually a, a, argued to be a thing lacking in, in material substance altogether. It has no mass, no volume, no weight, no size, no shape, so it's not extended in space, to use Descartes' terminology, but yet is thinking. So some people believe there's two different things. One is like the mind, which is not physical, maybe even spiritual or supernatural because it lacks physical uh, shape, size, and extension, and it has consciousness. But other people say, no, there's nothing besides the physical. Everything's just made out of matter. Even the brain, that's just the same thing that they call the mind by another name. Okay, now another question in the same field is, um, it's kind of related to the first one. So. It could be a little bit of overlap, but the second question is kind of this one that um, we could ask, um, is it possible to explain consciousness physically? So can consciousness be explained entirely on a physical basis or not? Can consciousness be explained physically? So we have consciousness. I mean, just examine your experience right now. You're perceiving uh, vision and sound, I would assume, um, of this lecture. And, um, you know, we could just continue to talk about all the aspects and elements of your consciousness. Go into your mind right now and think of a memory uh, of like your last birthday or something, right? If you can access that memory, 
then that's another uh, episode of your consciousness, having the memorial recall and seeing within the mind's eye or whatever the previously perceived images of those events. So whether it's dreams, hopes, fears, emotions, thoughts, ideas, uh, visions, taste, color, uh, sound, those are all aspects of the full range of conscious experiences that beings like us have got. But the question here is, is that something that could be explained altogether just on a physical basis? Is the physical uh, flesh and blood m operations of your body all that it takes to explain the existence of consciousness? Some people say yes, and some people say no. Some people think that consciousness is something so rich and the subjectivity that it has means that it cannot be fully captured by a reductive physical analysis. But that's a debate, you know? Yeah, there are some people that think that consciousness is ultimately just a playing out of a very complex physical process, but other people say that doesn't make sense to them. A third question that we're gonna try and explore, um, this one we'll get to next week, I believe, but it's the question, maybe I'll put it here because I'm running out of room at the bottom. But this third one is, could a machine ever have consciousness or think like we have? Okay, is that possible or no? Could a machine ever have consciousness? So, um, question, you know, this is a question that really would not have made much sense to people living in previous periods of human history. So I think it's interesting that we're some of the only people who've ever lived, right, that have been able to even contemplate this issue. Um, living in the year 2020, we have a lot of uh, computers and artificial intelligence. And um, some people wonder whether or not we'll reach a time in the future where we've built computing systems so intelligent and so sophisticated that they actually exhibit consciousness like us. Is it possible to build thinking machines that actually have thoughts, feelings, ideas, um, or is that not possible? And there are differences of opinion on that. We'll read one author, Alan Turing, who's actually the original creator of the digital computer. And um, he had this really kind of visionary idea that in some time of the future, there will be thinking machines. So coming from the creator of the computer, I think that's an interesting and somewhat you know, considerable viewpoint to take uh, seriously. But not everyone agrees with Turing's position. Some people think that no matter how advanced and sophisticated these machines become, that they'll never actually have a real consciousness. Can you imagine a future world where we build like um, robots that simulate human beings to such an extent that you could have full on friendships with them? Like you call up an Android like that's got a human form and you say, hey, do you wanna just chill and watch some movies? Or like um, maybe go to a concert and they're like, yeah, but I'm kinda tired or I don't know, that sounds fun. You know, you're having like just a normal human conversation but it's completely with like a cyborg or, or something like that. Could such a thing have sentience? Or do you believe that no matter what it actually does, it's just behavior but there's no actual internal quality of consciousness happening. Do you think maybe there's something about machines that are man-made man and that are created from you know, electrical components that bars them from ever possibly having consciousness? Does it have to be an organic, like biological life form for consciousness to exist? Or can it be generated um, by means of electrical components that we build uh, when we build comput computers, machines, and artificial intelligence? So that's another interesting debated point, and we'll touch on that too. If machines could ever have consciousness, that would really be something, huh? Because we'd be sort of almost like the gods to those machines in a way, right? Because they'd look at us as their creators. Um, if they could have consciousness, you wonder if that means that consciousness really is just totally physical. Because if machines had, could have it, that would go some way towards establishing that um, a physical system can generate it. And therefore, you might start thinking there's really no such thing as the soul, because even machines can think. But anyway... Um, we've got our new topic. We see some of the big basic questions here. Um, next thing I want to tell you about on this topic are what are two of the big positions that people take in the philosophy of mind? You know, so like in every debated area of philosophy, there are different positions that people hold and that they you know, disagree with each other about. In philosophy of religion, we saw some people are theists, some people are atheists, and they try and provide their reasonable arguments for both. In ethics, some people are utilitarians that are consequentialist in their thinking. Others are Kantians that are deontological in their ethical thinking, and they each argue that their view, their view of ethics is the better one or the one that's correct. In um, epistemology, we had the theory of knowledge given by ancient Greeks, which was later challenged by contemporary writers living today. And um, just now in the metaphysics of time, we have Newton and the common sense everyday conception of time, which says that it's linear 
that's unaffected by the events and motions of objects in space, uh, and that only the present moment really exists. But then the Einstein theory of relativity seems to indicate that that's not true. Uh, and so the space-time theory is like a rival to the Newtonian picture. Well, now in the philosophy of mind, we need to learn about what some of the big debates are as well. And so I'm going to introduce you to at least one of them, and we'll talk about it as we go on. So two, two major positions in the philosophy of mind. <clears throat> So these are the kind of the two big camps that people divide into and have their competing arguments. Two main positions in the philosophy of mind. Okay, so one of these two views is called monism, and then the other one is called dualism. Okay, so first of all, monism here. And just below, I'll put the term dualism, and we'll fill that in a moment. <clears throat> so what is monism in the philosophy of mind? Monism is the, be the belief that everything in the whole universe is made out of just one kind of substance. That everything, no matter whether it's a table, a chair, a human being, uh, a building, a planet, at the end of the day, it's all just made out of one kind of thing. Okay, so that's monism. Everything in the universe is made out of only one kind of substance. Everything's built out of, composed out of, comprised out of only one kind of substance. Everything in the universe is made out of only one kind of substance. That's monism. Dualism, by contrast, it's easy to uh, state what it is. It's the alternative view that the universe and everything within it, it's not made out of one thing, but of two kinds of substances. Dualism says that everything in the universe is made out of two kinds of different substances. Okay. So I wrote the definition there, and what it says is that dualism definition, everything in the universe is made out of two kinds of substances, not one. Now, um, <clears throat> about the etymology, etymology is a word that refers to the, um, the breakdown and analysis of the root meanings of parts of words. So monism has the root mo mono, which refers to one, like monogamy is to have one partner, or... Um, to speak a monologue um, on stage is to have a soliloquy given by one actor. Uh, mono speakers, that's just having one audio channel, okay? Dualism has the root dual, which refers to two. So, um, you know, name a better duo. It's like two people, right? So that has to do with two. So anyways then, as the root suggests, monism claims that this whole universe and everything within it is just made out of one type of substance. But dualism, there's actually two. But what are these two substances, or one, that are being discussed by either of the two theories? Let's go over those because uh, that's definitely key to understanding how this debate proceeds. So I'm going to erase those definitions, and we're going to talk now about these two possible substances. <clears throat> so two possible kinds of substance. Okay, so now the first of these two possible substances is just physical matter. Physical matter. So what's physical matter? Physical matter is just anything that is extended in space. Okay, um, so that's it. It's really just anything that occupies any range or... Uh, amount of space. If something would occupy even the smallest tiny piece of space, then it's physical matter. It's extended, it's got mass, it's got volume, shape, it would displace, I guess, water if it was significantly large. 
So that's physical matter. Anything that takes up or is extended in space. And um, what would be the most minimal unit of matter? Remind me again. When you break matter down to its most small um, element, what's the term? It's a common term that a lot of people use. Atoms, yes. Okay, good. So I'm going to put in parentheses here uh, that, that word atoms because physical matter is just at the base level atoms um, now atoms aggregate to form larger objects like this marker in my hand is a bunch of atoms grouped together a certain way and forming this object um, and anything else in space that has mass is a constellation of atoms aggregated together in a particular pattern and form okay so that's one of the possible substances, matter. Now the other substance that's discussed is what's called mind, okay? Now the terminology mind, as it's used by um, philosophers, refers to something that's a little bit more closely related to the idea of the soul or the spirit. So what the mind is, is something that's not extended in space. We're talking about something that does not have uh, any size, shape, weight, mass, volume at all. It's literally not in space. It's got no parts. So it's like a zero point. It's just nothingness in terms of its spatial extension. So it has no extension in space, not extended in space. And now the second part of the definition is key. Not extended in space and is thinking. So not extended, this physical matter is extended. So the idea of the mind would be the idea of like an immaterial, disembodied consciousness. A consciousness that can exist in a complete disembodied state, having no material basis or backing. So if you think of like a person dying and like their soul escaping the body and somehow continuing to have consciousness, thought, and all of that, that would be sort of like the idea of the mind. Now, while you're alive, the idea of the mind would be that it's this kind of somehow non-extended element of you that is responsible for the ability you have to think and perceive. Now, um, <clears throat> I told you that there is monism and dualism, right? And what's monism again? It's the view that everything in reality and the universe is made out of only one kind of substance. But since there are these two different possible substances, there's actually two kinds of monism. Okay, so I'm going to erase that info, and we're quickly going to just talk about the two different types of monism. Basically, one type of monism is called physicalism, and those are the monists that say the only substance is matter, and everything's made out of it. Another type of monist is what's called an idealist. It's not as well popular anymore, the idea of idealism, but in the philosophy of mind, what idealism refers to is the thought that everything's made out of just thoughts and ideas, and there's actually no matter anywhere. It's all just mental. But um, let me put those definitions here, and we'll talk more about them. So two types of monism. Okay, so there is physicalist monism, which is called physicalism. And then idealism contrasted with that. Okay, so at the top there, physicalism. Physicalism is uh, the view that everything in reality is made out of physical matter, including us and our consciousness. So let me put it up here. Everything in the universe is made out of physical matter, which again is ultimately atoms. 
Everything in the universe is made out of physical matter, including us and our consciousness. So that's one possible type of monism. This is, again, the monism, which claims that the only substance that makes everything is matter. And so when you have conscious beings like us, we're just made out of matter. And our consciousness is also just made out of matter. To a physicalist, what is consciousness? It's the brain doing its thing physically. It's the uh, neurons and synapses firing and the brain waves propagating in that skull that cause consciousness to exist. So how is it that you're able to hear me and watch me right now? Because of the brain that's functioning in your head. According to a physicalist, there's a clear reason why some things have consciousness and other things don't. So like, see this marker that I'm holding in my hand, which I'm writing on the board with? Do you guys think this marker has consciousness? Like it's chilling and just checking out the lecture and wondering about what we're talking about? Of course not. I hope that no one would even think so, right? Because it's obvious that this marker does not have consciousness. It's an inanimate object. But me and you do have consciousness. Now that's interesting. What could be the difference between us and the marker such that it doesn't have it, but we do? And a physicalist would just tell you, well, the, cl the clear answer is that there's not the sort of physical structure physiologically for this object to exhibit consciousness. It doesn't have a central nervous system. It doesn't have a functioning brain. And so absent those physical features, a thing will not have consciousness. But me and you, thankfully, for whatever reason, we do have a brain and we have a nervous system connected to that brain, which is able to uh, display the features of consciousness, which you're experiencing right now. So you could argue then that where there's no functioning brain or physiological support, consciousness doesn't exist. Um, so if you're a physicalist, you don't believe in the existence of the soul or the afterlife because it couldn't possibly be the case according to this theory that consciousness can float free of a body and just be in some disembodied state um, where there's no brain that functions, consciousness doesn't exist either. So on this view, when ashes to ashes and dust to dust, you know, return your body to nothingness, and the brain doesn't work, and it's dead, then consciousness is dead too. It's not like there could be something that survives the destruction of the material body. So that's one type of perspective called physicalism. Does that maybe make sense? I mean, hopefully it's somewhat clear. Uh, these are, you know, lofty ideas and concepts, but I'm trying my best to just bring them down to a level of everyday common sense. That's what physicalism says. Everything's made out of matter. You're just made out of matter, and so am I. Now, we're very interesting material objects because we have perception and stuff, and other material objects don't. But that's just a difference of degree, not of kind. We just have a very sophisticated physical process playing out in the brain, which results in consciousness as this byproduct. But um, consciousness is not something that can possibly exist according to physicalism without the proper physical basis. Okay. But there's also idealism, a different type of monism. Idealists say, that everything in the universe is just made out of ideas. So there's no matter at all, but just thoughts. That's a weird idea or thought process, but it's that. So everything in the universe is made out of ideas. <clears throat> okay, now um, I really just wanted to bring up idealism so that I could tell you what it means so we could be you know fully complete and comprehensive but just so you know it's not really a viewpoint that most people take too seriously today in 2020. It I think had a little more popularity a couple centuries ago there's some interesting authors like there's this philosopher from the uh, 1700s George Barclay who was a bishop in a Christian church and he believed uh, in idealism and he gave arguments for it which are in some cases pretty good arguments but Today, anyway, a lot of people don't think it's very uh, credible because uh, it just sounds pretty far-fetched, right? To think that like this table and the surroundings around you that really appear to have mass and to be solid physical objects are somehow just ideas that are formed in the mind. Um, now, you might be wondering then, if idealism was true, then what happens to the objects when we're not thinking of them or perceiving them, right? So like if nobody right now is thinking of Pluto, does it really exist? Uh, okay, let me tell you about that. So the most sophisticated versions of idealism say, yes, the objects which you and I or no one are currently perceiving still have their independent existence because it's God that serves as the thinker in that case. So God, you know, has the idea 
of the distant objects out there in the universe that none of us have access to perceiving. And for as long as he chooses to keep thinking about them, then they'll still exist. But if God wanted to at any point, he could just cause big portions of reality to cease to exist by ceasing to think about them. So when we are not available as the thinker, God's the thinker having the idea of that object. So that's why things appear to have their own independent existence apart from the thought of the mind. Anyway, I don't want you to get too caught up on idealism because mostly after this, just telling you what it is, we're really going to be focused on the debate between physicalism and dualism. So the kind of monism that is the most popular and well-regarded today is physicalism because we've made so many powerful advances in the, in the sciences and with physics that it seems that, um, you know, there's definitely maybe a kernel of truth or some grain of truth in the thought that matter could be everything. Um, so that's a more well-respected and well-received perspective today, but idealism has still got its adherents. Okay. When I'm telling you that we're going to consider the debate between monism and dualism, just know that I'm really telling you we're looking at the debate and discussion between physicalism and dualism, with idealism kind of being relegated here to the margins, but we wanted to know what it is. So those are two types of monism, right? But remember that there's also dualism. So when it comes to dualism, they say there's not just the one type of substance. It's not just everything's matter or everything's mind. In dualism, there's both. So in dualism, the thought is the universe and everything in it is made out of both types of substances, matter, but then also mind. Now to a dualist, most of the things in the universe are made out of matter. Because if you just were to, I don't know, take like a measurement of the mass of how much stuff out there is just not thinking, just inert, dead matter, that would be the vast majority of like the bulk of uh, the material universe. But um, consciousness also exists in the universe. We have it, for example, and you can just tap into it right now, thinking about your own consciousness. So a dualist says there's matter, you know, atoms building up physical objects that are extended in space, but somehow there's also this immaterial, non-extended mind that's somehow residing within your physical body or connected to it in some sense. And there's both substances. So to a dualist, there's both. To a monist, there's just the one. And depending on which one they think is the only one, you've got both either physicalism or idealism. Okay, so we're now going to launch into a series of um, essays by these various authors, which try to give arguments for either monism or dualism. And what we're starting with is the argument for dualism given by our friend Rene Descartes. So we're coming back to read a little bit more of Descartes' work, who we first studied a little while ago when we talked about the method of doubt. So Descartes' a dualist. And in his book, The Meditations, he gives a big complex argument for dualism. So it's my job now to just try and tell you guys about Descartes' argument for dualism. And then that'll provide a basis for comparison and critique when we get to the monist physicalists that say dualism is wrong. Okay, so author then, for now, is back to this guy, Rene Descartes. René Descartes is the French philosopher of the 17th century who lived from 1596 to 1650. In 1641, he wrote a classic book called The Meditations, full title, Meditations on First Philosophy. And um, in that book, we learn about his argument for dualism. Now, just so that we kind of get reacquainted with his book for a moment, um, a couple of weeks ago when we talked about it, we learned the first two chapters. This is a book with six chapters, and each chapter of the book is numbered a different meditation in order through one to six. So there's meditation one, two, three, four, five, and six. And we studied the first two meditations a couple weeks back. When we did, we were learning about epistemology, and I'm um, sorry. We're learning about epistemology, and um, Descartes' interest, one of them, in writing that book, is the question, what can we know for absolutely certain? What is things, or what are some things that are totally certain? And he said we have to discover that because that's the sort of thing that will serve as a foundation for the body of scientific knowledge that we're trying to grow and expand. 
So let's look for certainty. And how do we find it? He says, use the method of doubt. The method of doubt was this method. It said, assume that something is false if there's any possible way that it could be doubted. Okay. And so he said, if you use that method, you'll be able to uh, illuminate what things can be doubted and there will be dismissed. And then whatever remains after that will be that solid certainty that we're trying to find. Okay, so just a couple of additional summary points about the first two meditations because it connects to this one. He said that with the method of doubt, you're able to doubt everything you've perceived with your five senses um, and even math and logic. The reason he said that you can doubt everything from the five senses is because maybe it's a dream. You don't know. I mean, it seems like what you're experiencing right now is real. But if your whole life was a big dream, then you have no experience to contrast and compare it with. So maybe you're just being deceived. And uh, while you think you're having this perceptual experience, you're actually locked away in a dream state and you don't know what the reality is actually like. So um, because of the method of doubt, he says, let's assume that everything you perceive with the five senses is just false and just an illusion. And even when it comes to math and logic, which you might initially think to be more certain than that, he says that can be doubted too, because maybe there's this external deceiver, like in his case, he calls it an evil demon. And if there were such an external source of deception, then that could be someone who manipulates your ability to even come to correct conclusions about those things like math and logic. So, so almost everything can be doubted, but there's this one thing that can't be doubted. And um, do you remember what that one thing was according to Descartes? That no one could ever doubt. It's simply what thing. <clears throat> even the method of doubt can't touch it. It's, it's the, uh, the certain knowledge that what? <clears throat> Descartes says one thing escapes the method of doubt and remains certain. It's not the things that you perceive with your five senses. It's not the math and logic, but it's just that you exist exactly. Why is that certain again, Sherry? Why is that totally certain? According to the you know common sense argument he gives there, why can't you doubt you exist? How come I can't doubt that I exist? I want to doubt it. I'm going to try and doubt it right now. Uh, yeah, because even if you're doubting something, you're still thinking. So the fact that you're thinking just proves that you, the thinker, are something that exists, even if your perceptions are off and reality around you is not as it appears to be. Okay. So just wanted to remind you about those elements of the first two meditations because it comes back into play now. Now we're at the sixth meditation, which is the sixth chapter. So we've skipped the middle three, three, four, and five. The sixth meditation of this book is where Descartes uh, gives the argument for dualism and where he also tries to say, you know what? Actually, we actually can be confident in some of the things that the method of doubt initially caused us to have some doubts about. So it's kind of like only at the very end of the book, in the final chapter, does he try to reestablish the everyday certainty we have about things that we do perceive about the external world. So he doesn't want to help himself to these conclusions. He wants to try and prove them through a deliberate course of argument starting from scratch. So next goal of this meeting is to take you guys through Descartes' argument for dualism presented there in the sixth meditation. Now, um, there's some material in the intervening chapters three, four, and five that, of course, we don't have in our book. And um, some of it is relevant to the presentation of his argument for dualism. The sixth meditation itself refers to the argument, and it sometimes makes a little bit of indirect reference to the content that just preceded it. So I'm going to right now distill his argument in a clear format for everybody to understand so that you can understand exactly how he believes dualism is true and why. Okay, so Descartes' argument for dualism. Okay, so with arguments in logic and in philosophy, they're often written in what is called standard form. And uh, we've seen a couple of arguments written out in that type of logical order a few times in the class. Here's a reminder about how that works. When you have arguments in logic, um, the standard form says that you're going to write the conclusion of the argument at the bottom. And then the premises of the argument are listed above that with a horizontal line dividing the premises from the conclusion. 
Okay, the conclusion is the claim that you're trying to establish as true. And the premises are the reasons or the evidence that is supposed to justify that conclusion. Um, it has a similar visual structure on the page to your old school elementary mathematical problems. So if you remember looking at problems like this, 2 plus 2 equals 4. When the formula is written out in this vertical way, you see the sum at the bottom, which is the uh, summation of the factors above plus the mathematical operation of addition. This dividing line tells you that this is the result, and these are the things that generate the result above. Now, in logic, we're not dealing with numbers per se, but we're dealing with propositions. And you see that same type of structure repeated in logic. The final bottom statement is the conclusion that results from the premises that appear above it. So this is one argument for dualism given by Descartes. The ultimate conclusion is that the mind and the body are two separate things. But it's a detailed argument, and there are many premises that have to be observed before we get to that conclusion. So I'm going to walk you through the argument. And because I don't have a full whiteboard, just this panel, basically, there are going to be frequent occasions where I'm going to have to erase a few premises to add the next few. So we'll take our time and take this argument line by line. But let's get started then at the beginning. So first premise of the argument. I'm going to number each premise as seen there um, so that we keep clear in our mind and in our notes which premises go in which order. Okay, so here's the first premise of the argument. It just says that using the method of doubt, I'm able to doubt everything perceived by the five senses and even math and logic. Okay, so that's the first opening premise, that with the method of doubt which we've described, it's possible to doubt a lot of things. It's possible to doubt, as we have said, everything you perceive with the five senses, meaning everything that you can see, taste, touch, hear, or smell, but also that you can even doubt uh, propositions of math and logic because maybe of the evil demon. But then we get to the second premise, and the second premise just says, what we've repeated earlier, that despite this, that you can doubt everything perceived by the senses and even math, despite that, uh, it is certain that you exist, at least as a mind, because you are thinking. Okay, so despite this, I know for certain that I exist. at least as a mind, and why do I know that? Because I am thinking. Okay, second premise says that despite premise one, despite the fact that the method of doubt raises doubts about everything I'm perceiving and even the things that I think I know mathematically, even though those things are subject to doubts, Nonetheless, I do know for certain that I exist, at least as a mind. Why? Because I'm thinking. Let me make sure we understand premise two. So, again, we know that we, or I shouldn't say we, because each individual has only access to their own consciousness. So you, for example, know that you exist um, because you are thinking. But what is it that you know to exist? Uh, you don't necessarily know that you have this body that you think you have, because the body that you think you have is something that you see. And vision is one of the five senses. So it could be that it's only seen in the dream that you're having. <clears throat> so who knows if you really even have a body. Maybe right now you're just a disembodied mind dreaming the physical frame that you think you actually do have. But even if that was true, the existence of the mind that's thinking, that's got to be there. So even if you have no material substance and you're just a mental object that thinks, that's a given because you are thinking. So... Method of doubt raises doubts about all this other stuff, but there's one thing that can't be doubted, and that is that you yourself exist, at least as a mind, 
because you were thinking. Okay, so those are the first two premises of the argument. And like I told you, there's many premises and much more to come. So I'm going to erase that, and we're going to go over the next couple of them. At any point, if anything I'm saying needs to be clarified or you want me to go over it again, just let me know, and I'm always happy to, to go back to it. But okay, so next couple of premises of this argument. <clears throat> Okay, so here's premise three. Premise three says that, okay, so what we've gotten so far established in the course of the argument is just that you yourself exist as a mind which is thinking. That's something certain because you are thinking and therefore the thinker has to exist even if there's no body attached. Now, since you know you're a mind that's thinking, we can say that you do have ideas in that mind. And what Descartes says now is that in my mind there are ideas, but one of them kind of stands alone and is different from the rest. It's the idea of something, you know, more uh, great and infinite in comparison to everything else. So this is almost kind of going to call us back into some of our earlier meetings on philosophy of religion. So that's a big hint. What do you think he's thinking of here? He says, okay, you're a mind thinking. And if nothing else, you've got to have, you do have ideas. But in that mind, included in your ideas, there's this one special idea, the idea of what being you think he's talking about. So he says, in my mind, there are ideas, including the idea of who? And again, the idea that I'm mentioning, which I'm trying to get you to supply an answer for, it's the idea of a being, which is thought of as infinite and greater than anything. So he says, in the mind of, of you, there's this one idea, and it's the idea of what? God, exactly. Okay, good. So let me put that here, and we'll go on. So... In my mind, there are ideas, including the idea of God. So, you know, I'm going to keep reminding you of the previous steps of the argument so that we kind of keep continuity with them. But it begins by saying the method of doubt establishes the possibility of doubt for all things perceived by the senses, even math and so on. But second premise, never the, nevertheless, I still know I exist, at least if I, as a mind, because I'm thinking. And now we have this third premise. So from the point of view that I exist as a thinking thing, I know I've got ideas. And one of those ideas is the idea of God. Now that is going to give him leverage to take the next few steps in the argument. So the next premise builds on this. He says, well, the idea of God, when you think about it, this is a unique idea. It's different from every other thing you could think of. Because he says the idea of God alone is the idea of an infinite being. Okay, so I'm going to put that here. Premise four. The idea of God is unique because it is the idea of an infinite being. It's unique, it's special, you know, it's it's one of a kind. The idea of God is unique because it is the idea of an infinite being. Okay, so what he's basically saying here is think right now in your mind of just anything, you know, tables, chairs, planets, stars, people, objects, events, all those different things, whatever they are, they're the idea of things that are finite, okay? Finite means that it's got limits. If you think about, you know, I mean, like uh, like my pet cat that you guys have seen in these videos a couple times. It's sad to say, but I'm acutely aware of the fact that, you know, she's not an immortal being. She hasn't always existed. She's existed for 16 years, so she has existed for quite a while. But uh, she hasn't been there since the beginning of time, and she won't be there till the end of time, right? She has limits in time and space. She's not everywhere, and she's not in every time. She's in some small part of space and some small part of time, but she's got limitations, right? So she's finite, just like me and you, okay? We live a little longer, maybe we're a little bigger spatially and temporally, but uh, we're not immortal beings either, and we have our own limits. So that's the same with anything. When you think of this table that's here, it started to exist at some point when it was assembled. And later on, I don't know, when the sun blows up, it's all going to turn to ash and won't exist then. So um, 
when you think of anything else except for God, you're thinking of things that are finite. Even the universe itself, they say, has a starting time, and it, you know, whatever, I guess, could be annihilated. So um, the idea of God, though, is not like that. When you think of God, you think of something unlimited, absolutely infinite, having no beginning, no end, it's just ultimate. So he says that's an idea in our mind, and it's kind of special because it's the only idea of something that's an infinite being. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to move on to our next premises. I'm going to clear the board so we can get space. Moving to premise five. <clears throat> All right, so to get that next premise up there, we have to kind of think about um, this concept of what could cause the idea of God that we have. Okay, so he's gone as far as to indicate that we do have an idea of God which is special and unique because it's the idea of an infinite being. But the next step of the argument asks, where could that idea have possibly come from? Where could the idea of God have come from so now it's planted in your mind? What he says is the cause of that idea has to have at least as much reality as the idea does. Okay, um, so let me... Uh, Pause for a moment in the stating of the argument to give you some explanation with a quick diagram. Uh, way back in the day when I was a college student at UCLA studying the same stuff in philosophy, I had a good professor that provided this uh, illustration of this next concept. So I thought it was helpful, and I'm now I'm going to pass it on to you. Okay, so just study this diagram for a minute. Here is a cup, or let's call it a container. Okay, this container, let's just label it uh, B. So this here is container B. In the container, let's say there's one gallon of water. That is one gallon of water. All right, so now I'm going to tell you the next thing here. Uh, this container with a gallon of water in it, it got that gallon of water from another container, which let's label A. Okay? So I have a question for you about A. How big does A have to be at least? for it to have deposited a gallon in B. Since B receives all of its contents from A, we can deduce something clearly, that A has to be greater than or equal to how big in terms of storage capacity or volume, right? See if you can follow my question and give me that answer. Yeah, A has to be a minimal, uh, at minimum a gallon, right? It could be more than a gallon and it just gave some of its content to B, but it can't be less, isn't that true? There's no way, for example, that A is a half gallon container and the smaller container, less than a gallon, gave a gallon to B. That's just not logically possible, right? Um, so this has to be, you know, greater than or equal to one gallon, the size of A. Okay, now, <clears throat> I'm going to replace this with some uh, elements from the argument here that we're looking at. Now, I want you to think about you as kind of by metaphor or analogy, kind of being like that container B. Here's you. I probably, if I was going to be 100% faithful to Descartes, I shouldn't even draw the stick figure because who knows if you really have a body, at least yet. But we have to draw something. I can't just draw like nothing. So suppose that's you. And um, here's your mind thinking of a thought. What thought is it? It's the thought of God. Now, what he said about this idea of God is that it's the idea of what kind of being again? It's the idea of a and infinite being. So I'm just going to write the symbol for infinity here to indicate that this idea that you have of God is you thinking about something infinite in your mind. Okay? So what he's saying is that idea has to come from some source. The idea that's in your mind of God, it has to derive from some source. It has to come from somewhere, basically. So... What's the source of the idea of God? Well, by analogy to the container thing, the only possible source of the idea of God has to be something with at least how much reality, right? If it gives you an idea of something infinite, it has to not, it can't have less than that amount of reality. So whatever the cause of your idea of God is, has to be, are you saying, Max, the answer here? It has to be an infinite being. That's correct, right? Because in the same exact way, the infinite idea of God couldn't possibly be generated from something less than infinite. That would be like getting a smaller container to give more than what it's capable of giving in terms of its total carrying capacity. So the only way you can get an idea of God in your mind 
is if there's something that causes the idea which actually has infinite reality. And that means that this thing here is just God and God exists. Why does this author say that God has to exist? Because that's the only possible explanation of what could have caused your idea of God, right? So he says, if you trace the idea of God that you have to its source, it has to come from a source that at least has enough reality to give you the idea. So it can't come from something finite because that's not enough reality to impart to your infinite idea of him. So this then just becomes Descartes' argument for the existence of God. It's sort of um, me, uh, in the middle of the argument, he tries to prove God's existence, but we're not done yet. This is just one additional step. So let me go ahead and then put on the table the fifth premise, which is my, uh, this was to explain and show you guys how that fifth premise is supposed to be understood. So now we can say it. The fourth premise was that the idea of God is unique because this is the idea of an infinite being. So what the fifth premise just says is that the cause of my idea of God has to have infinite reality, and so therefore God exists. The only possible cause of my idea of God is an infinite being, and therefore that is just God. <clears throat> So God exists. So there in five steps, we've gotten, according to Descartes, a proof of the existence of God. It might remind you a little bit of Anselm's ontological argument. There's definitely differences between the two, but the similarity would be that uh, in Anselm's case, he said there has to be a God because we have an idea of a greatest conceivable being and it's greater to exist in reality than to only exist in the mind. Similar to that, but a little different, Descartes is saying, well, the idea you have of God establishes that he exists because that idea is too great to not be derived from a source that's actually infinite. So they're both kind of trying to build a bridge from an idea in the mind of God to the external existence of God in the actual reality. But never mind that for now, as long as you understand how we reach this point in the argument, we're ready to take the next step forward. So the next premise goes on from here to say, okay, well, now that he thinks he's proven God exists, he thinks he has like a little leverage to add a couple of additional claims. Since God exists, he's known to be perfectly good. In other words, omnibenevolent. Okay, so since God exists and is known to be perfectly good, he is not a deceiver. Okay. Okay, God exists, perfectly good, so he's not a deceiver. Okay, so having proven he believes that God exists, he's able to state that the nature of this being of God is that he's perfect in every way, including that he's morally perfect, so he's perfectly good, omnibenevolent is the term there. If he's perfectly good, then he would not want to deceive us, okay, because deception manipulating people, tricking them, making them think one thing is true, but it's actually not, that's inconsistent with goodness. That's bad. So God's not bad. He's good to the highest infinite degree. So what that means is that he's not a deceiver. And if he's not a deceiver, next premise coming up, that means that uh, when you have clear and distinct perceptions of things, they have to be true. They're guaranteed to be true, and they're backed by the guarantee of God's goodness. Because if clear and distinct perceptions, the things that you take to be the most obvious and obviously true, things that you would never normally doubt at all, right? If those things were actually false, then God would be setting you up just to fail. He would be creating you in his own image, but just so that you would have these 
clear and evident perceptions to you, but that are actually false. If that's the way that God has created us, then he's not perfectly good, but that's impossible because he is perfectly good. So next premise is that since God is perfectly good, this implies that when you have clear and distinct perceptions, they must be true. All right. <clears throat> Okay, premise seven. Since God is not a deceiver, whenever I have a clear and distinct perception, it must be true. Okay, so since God's not a deceiver, when I have these clear and distinct perceptions, they must be true. Um, so, yeah, just another sort of repetition of the concept here. What he's saying is, let's go back to the beginning for a minute, okay? Just walk through the steps of the argument again. It starts with just noting that in the method of doubt, almost everything can be doubted. Everything you perceive with the senses, even math and all those things. But one thing that cannot be doubted in premise two is that you exist at least as a mind, if not a body, but at least as a mind, because you are thinking. Okay, now in your mind there are different ideas, but one of them stands alone and is unique because it's the idea of an infinite being, God. Where could that idea have come from? Well, since it's the idea of something infinite, it can't come from a source that is not itself infinite, so it would have to derive from an infinite being, and that could only be God. So God must exist because it's the only possible explanation of how you even got the idea of God in your mind. He caused you to have it and nothing else could have. So God exists. Next point is that he's known as perfectly good. So he would not deceive you. And to be precise, the fact that he's not a deceiver means that if you have very clear and distinct perceptions of things, those are the kind of perceptions that have to be true. Because God would not want you to have the most obvious judgments that would seem so clear and yet those be false. That would contradict his perfect goodness. So at least when you have clear and distinct perceptions, they have to be true. Okay, so the next premise says that one of my clear and distinct perceptions is this, that if two things can be clearly conceived of as existing separately in the mind, then those two things can actually exist separately in reality. Okay, so um, that's a bit of a long premise, so I'm going to erase this and put it at the top. Premise eight. <clears throat> So one of my clear and distinct perceptions is that if two things can be clearly conceived of as existing separately in the mind, then they actually are two separate things in reality. <clears throat> Okay, one of my clear and distinct perceptions is that if two things can be clearly conceived of as existing separately in the mind, then they actually are two separate things in reality. Okay, so um, let me go into a quote here from Descartes on page 556. This is a helpful quote to explain his reasoning on this. It's in the left column of page 556. Um, let me talk to you about it a little and then I'll read that quote. What is being said in this premise is this. One thing that's clear and distinct is that if you can imagine two things being separated from each other, and it's clear in your mind that those two things could exist apart from each other, then that means that it's not just in your mind that they're separate, but in 
actual reality, those two things could also exist separately. So in other words, they're non-essential to each other and they can be divided out. Um, let me give you this example right here. So you see this watch on my wrist? Can you uh, clearly imagine this watch and me being separated from each other? Right now, it's not separated from me. It's right there on my body and it's touching my hand or my arm. But can you imagine a possibility of this watch being separated from me? Is that something that you can clearly conceive of? That this watch, though it's on my arm and wrist now, could exist separately from me and me separately from it? Can you clearly imagine that? Sure, okay, obviously. I know that's easy, right? Do I have to really demonstrate it so that we can see that it's possible? No, not really, because you can already just clearly imagine that that's a possibility. But just to be even more you know, explicit, watch. Okay. Bam, now it's over there, I'm over here, we're separated. I could keep getting further away from it, right? I could leave it behind and go a million miles away or however far away I could really go. Um, so look, we didn't really have to see me take it off to understand that me and the watch don't have to be together. We're two separate things. So we had a connection there for a bit, but I don't need the watch to exist and it doesn't need me to exist. We can and we are right now existing separately. So we were joined together at the wrist for a moment, but we can exist separately. The point here is that when you can imagine in your mind any two things existing separately, whether it's me and a watch or, you know, me and these glasses or, you know, anything else, if the two things could be thought of as existing separately and divided apart, then that's something that could actually happen in reality too. Okay, so let me read then Descartes putting the point his own way. He says this. Let me just give the book, come on. All right. <clears throat> He says, first I know that everything which I clearly and distinctly understand is capable of being created by God so as to correspond exactly with my understanding of it. Therefore, the fact that I can clearly and distinctly understand one thing apart from another is enough to make me certain that the two things are distinct since they are capable of being separated, at least by God. The question of what kind of power is required to bring about such a separation does not affect the judgment that the two things are distinct. Okay, now um, me and the watch, that's easy. We don't really need God to separate those two things because I could simply do it and demonstrate it for you. Other things that are mingled together would take a little bit more work to dis uh, disassociate from each other. Take, for example, the case of a glass of salt water. Okay, looks like the salt has dissolved into the water, so now they're completely mixed together and we can't divide them out. But of course, it would take a little bit of ingenuity and work, but there is precisely a process to do that. A desalinization plant would you know, boil up the water that's got salt in it, allow the condensation to collect, and then separate it from the salt content. Now you have the salt in one place and the water moisture of it in a different place. Um, so look, any two things that could conceivably be prized apart, separated apart, it remains that they actually are two separate things because whether it's easy or difficult to separate them, at least God would have the ability to separate the two things. Okay, so we're reaching very close to the end of this argument. There's only one more premise and then the conclusion, okay? So it says, one of my clear and distinct perceptions is that if two things could be clearly conceived of as existing separately in your mind, in your thought, then those same two things can actually be separate things in reality. Um, so premise nine is coming. So premise nine just says this. Um, I can clearly conceive of these two things existing separately, but before I write it, I wanna see if you guys can figure it out on your own. With the method of doubt, we've already uh, asked the question whether you even have a body, right? According to the method of doubt, maybe right now you don't have a body and you're just dreaming the thought that you have this body. But suppose that you do have one. The fact that you can imagine yourself existing with no body at all shows that you have a clear ability to conceive of these two things existing separately, the what and the what. You can imagine a possible situation where these two fundamental aspects of your being could exist separately. What do you think I'm talking about? You can imagine your blank and your blank existing separately. This is something that the method of doubt displays way back in the first meditation. Because if it's possible for you to doubt the existence of your body, then it's clearly possible to 
assume or wonder whether or not the two things are separate. Not God and man, Max, but Gilbert and, and Sherry, Gilberto and Sherry, you guys got the right response here. The mind and the body. He's saying the mind and the body can be clearly conceived of as existing separately. Okay. So in premise nine, I can clearly conceive, in the mind at least, I can clearly conceive of my mind and body existing separately. Right, so like we just talked about a different example. You can clearly conceive of me and that watch existing separately, or I'm wearing glasses right now. You can clearly conceive of me and the glasses existing separately. Um, this point is raised saying that you can also clearly conceive of or think of your mind and your body existing separately, all right? Now, um, why is that clearly conceivable? Because the method of doubt already says that your body can be doubted, but your mind cannot be doubted because trying to doubt the existence of your mind is a self-contradiction. The doubt itself proves that it exists. So since the existence of your body is something that may be real or maybe not real, but the existence of your mind is certainly real, you're already now contemplating the possibility that even at this present moment, you have no body and you're merely a mind dreaming the existence or hallucinating the existence of the body. So that shows us something, that we can actually think of a possibility of the mind existing without the body at all. Now, if you find that to be so weird and ridiculous, maybe check yourself a little bit, because I know most everybody out there probably believes in the afterlife and God and religion, right? But if you believe in the afterlife, then you have already thought of the same thought, that your body, which is going to get annihilated and turned into dust over time and decompose, if you believe that you could have a soul that survives into the afterlife, then you're saying the same exact thing, that you can clearly imagine a possibility of you being up in heaven or whatever, and your body being in a grave, and you still exist without the body attached. So do you understand, guys, what I'm trying to point out here? Descartes would make the point with reference to the method of doubt, which says to you that you could maybe even doubt the existence of the body, but not the mind, which shows the possibility, the proof of the possibility that you might only have the mind and no body. But even if you do have this body, you can still imagine a circumstance of departing from it, I guess, right? Uh, here, take another scenario that's a little more pop culture and maybe something you've heard about before. Sometimes people give these wild stories about like near-death experiences. Have you ever heard about those? Like people will say, I got into a messed up car accident and then I almost died. I was on the operating table. They were doing surgery and I started to have this experience where I could see my body below me and I'm watching all the operating team uh, you know, do their work on my body trying to save me my life. Uh, so for a moment I felt disembodied, like astral projection. I was out there away from it and sort of observing it from some other vantage point. The possibility of even thinking these thoughts, of having your mind, not talking about your brain, but like your soul, your spirit, somehow liberated from the physical frame of the body. The fact that that is something that you can imagine or conceive of shows that the two things are actually, now we get to the conclusion. So look at premise eight again in your notes, compare it to premise nine, and tell me what the conclusion is. Premise eight said that... Um, one of my clear and distinct perceptions is that if two things could be clearly conceived of as existing separately in the mind, that they actually are two separate things in reality, followed by the premise that I can clearly conceive of my mind and body existing separately. So what will you deduce from this? Finally, we've gotten to our conclusion, but just spell it out for me. Since I can clearly conceive of my mind and body existing separately, premise eight indicates that what? I can clearly conceive of them existing separately, and when I can clearly conceive of two things existing separately, that means that they what? What would you say is a uh, proper conclusion here? It's logically following from all the premises, but we're focused on eight and nine. What would follow from nine now? Since I can clearly conceive of the mind and body existing separately, Together with the premise that any such case leads to the conclusion that they're actually separate, what's the conclusion here? Look at premise 8, read premise 9, and then just tell me what's the right conclusion here. It should be clear enough. Tell me, what is it? The conclusion of the argument. What follows from the fact that I can clearly conceive of my mind and body existing separately? Since I can clearly imagine that, they actually are two separate things. Exactly, Sherry, good. So therefore, conclusion, the
the mind and the body are actually two separate things. And that conclusion is just dualism. Dualism is simply that view that there are two different substances. There's mind and there's matter. And if the mind and the body are two separate things and they're not the same, then that shows that dualism is true. So let me make sure we're all very clear as how we got to this conclusion. Why does he say the mind and the body are two separate things? Well, because I can conceive of them existing separately. Like I can think of a thought process where my mind exists in a different uh, place or not attached to the body. Um, since that's clearly conceivable, the two things must actually be separate because it's a clear and distinct perception and God who's perfectly good would not want those types of clear and distinct perceptions to turn out false. So God is the guarantor that clear and distinct perceptions are true. One of the clear and distinct perceptions is that when two things can be separated in thought, from each other, then they can exist separately from each other in the reality. Um, so in case of the watch example, I said to you, we can clearly conceive of me and this watch existing separately when it was still on my wrist. And I think we all had a clear understanding that, that means, yes, me and the watch are not the same thing. We're two separate things. Uh, I don't need this watch to exist, nor does it need me to exist. But now I'm giving you a different example, not me and a watch, but your mind and your body. Right now, According to dualism, your mind is somehow connected to this body that you've got. But it's not the same thing as the body, and it can and it will exist separately from the body after you die uh, when God affects the separation of the two things. So any two things that can conceivably be separated are actually separate because whether they have a connection or a mingling together for some temporary amount of time, it remains possible that they do get separated, and of course God who can make any possibility real, can and will uh, separate your mind from your body at the point where your body ceases to function and you die. So um, that's the overall argument for dualism given by Descartes. Now let me read the remainder of that pa uh, passage on page 556. It's a good passage and it's a quotable passage for anybody. If you choose to write on this topic, I would direct you to this quote on page 556. So he says here, <clears throat> thus, simply by knowing that I exist, and seeing at the same time that absolutely nothing else belongs to my nature or essence except that I am a thinking thing, I can infer correctly that my essence consists solely in the fact that I am a thinking thing. Now, it is true that I may have a body that is very closely joined to me, but nevertheless, on the one hand, I have a clear and distinct idea of myself insofar as I am simply a thinking, non-extended thing. That's a good definition of mind. Simply a thinking, non-extended thing. And on the other hand, I have a distinct idea of body insofar as this is simply an extended, not thinking thing. And accordingly, it is certain that I am really distinct from my body and I can exist without it. So just as much as this watch can be taken apart from my body and exist in that other part of space, so also could my soul, or as they call it, mind in these essays, exist separately from this body. Now, um, sometimes, again, I'm telling you that a lot of students will will – have like intellectual resistance to the possibilities being discussed here by Descartes. It's not uncommon that I'll hear a student comment that, uh, isn't this way out there, like way far out and weird, just the thought that I could have a mind existing separately from the body. But be careful when you say that, because if you deny the possibility that the mind can exist separately from the body, then you yourself don't believe or take seriously the concept of the afterlife. For you to take that idea seriously, you have to be a dualist. You have to think that the mind can exist without the bodily support. Uh, so is it really so strange what Descartes has said here? I don't know if it really is because, uh, eliminating that as a logical possibility, which if you're a physicalist, I guess maybe you will say that, but I think that that kind of undercuts a person's own religious commitments if they profess to believe those things, you know? So that's the argument for dualism. It's based on conceivability, this argument. It's based on the idea that because it's clearly conceivable, the two things really must be able to be separated since God makes sure that clear and distinct perceptions would not be false. And uh, God is known to exist because you have an idea of him, 
and the idea contains infinite reality, which can only derive from a source that has infinite reality. And we know you have this idea because you exist, and you are known to exist just because of the fact that you are thinking. So that's how the or argument goes. It leads us towards the ultimate conclusion here that there are two different kinds of substances when it concerns a person like me or you. We happen to have this body, but we're not essentially the body. The body can and will be disposed of over time. And the mind, according to this idea, is unaffected by that because it's not a part of space. It's not a part of matter. It's not something that can be decomposed because it's not even physical. So that's an interesting concept. Now, here's the last thing I guess I'll say uh, for today's meeting because we've kind of run close to the end. There's a major problem that dualists have to face, which is called the mind-body problem. That's probably one of the biggest thorns in the side of this whole argument that dualists do give. Uh, the mind-body problem is this basic problem. If we say that the mind and the body are two different substances, and that the mind is something that does not have any material nature and it has no extension in space, but the body is something that's extended and it's made out of matter and it's made out of atoms, how then could the two things interact with each other if one is physical and the other is not physical? That's a definite problem because, uh, like for example, I'm going to right now clap my hands. I just made my body do something by thinking of it in my mind. Now, then how is it exerting control and influence over the movements of my physical body? That's a definite problem because uh, the two things would appear to have completely distinct roles in the universe. The mind is not a physical object. So how can it cause the physical body to do its thing? How is my mouth speaking and these words coming out physically if the mind that's in control of it doesn't have any position in space? You would think that it couldn't therefore exert any kind of influence or cause, causal influence over anything else. Um, now, if you're a physicalist, which we're gonna develop next week, if you're a physicalist, then you don't have that mind-body problem because according to the physicalist, there's no such thing as the mind, there's just the brain. And the brain is a physical object. You know, it's that spongy um, organ that is inside your skull, uh, which is thought to be the neurological seat of your consciousness. So a physicalist doesn't have the mind-body problem. There's no mysterious relationship between the, the non-physical mind and the physical body. They just say what you call the mind is really just the brain, and that's physical. And so it exerts influence over the body because it's a part of the body. Um, but dualists definitely have trouble with that mind-body issue. Now, Descartes was aware of the mind-body problem, and he has a couple of writings where he tries to, you know, dismiss the problem, but I don't think he did the best job of getting rid of it. So I'll just leave you with this. In the time that Descartes lived, people were starting to learn more about human anatomy uh, because more sophisticated dissection and vivisection was happening of both animals and human specimens that had died and became cadavers. So they started to like examine different centers and parts of the brain actually, and they uh, discovered the existence of the pineal gland. Now in Descartes' time, they didn't really know what this pineal gland was doing. They kind of just, it was like a part of the brain that they didn't have a explanation of what its role was at that time. So Descartes, you know, people posed this mind-body problem to him like, hey Descartes, you know, how could your mind ever influence the body if it's not even a part of the body, if it's something that's not material? He said, okay, here's what I think is going on. This mysterious pineal gland. I think that's where the soul kind of somehow takes root and exerts its influence over the body, uh, kind of like the rem remote controller in this big like mech soldier like body structure. The, the soul enters the picture in the pineal gland and somehow um, exerts its authority, control, and so forth over your body from that seated position. But I find that this is a kind of weak solution to the problem because uh, how could a thing that doesn't have any material extension in space occupy any part of the brain? I mean, it's not anywhere. It's not like the mind is being described as a tiny little pellet that if you just dig deep enough, you'll find it somewhere buried inside the body. It's literally claimed to have no extension at all. So it sounds to me kind of just like a hand wavy kind of just trying to dismiss the problem, but it's it's not the most thorough answer. I mean, if the mind uh, could take residence in the pineal gland, then there wouldn't be a mind-body problem because we would just assume that its spatial position is really just kind of not problematic to discuss. So anyways, um, a lot of food for thought for you guys, all you good conscious minds out there enjoying your life. Uh, so I hope you had a good uh, meeting tonight, a good lecture, and uh, that you're having a good week. 
keep in mind what I said earlier in the meeting about the essay topics to come. Uh, that's not due until March, sorry, May 14th. So you've got a decent amount of time to work with it. Any questions from you guys? I know these are long meetings. Uh, I'm just trying to get through as much of it and give you as much content as possible. So if you don't have any questions and everything's good and well for now, then let's make sure we have a good week and resume next time. Um, my phone's dead. I was about to look at the syllabus, but you guys will look at the syllabus. We just have a couple more meetings uh, in the class. Next class period, next Thursday, the 30th, is finishing up philosophy of mind, and then hopefully we'll be able to start making progress towards the final topic of the class, which we'll probably talk about the second week after next week. Okay, guys. Well, um, Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, really good to see you guys. Hope you're doing well. Let me know if I can help you anyway as you know, you're working on your paper. If you have a draft or something, I'd be happy to give you comments as long as you give it to me with enough advanced time. So take care. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much. Oh, Jen, you messaged me on Canvas. Okay, yeah, that's good. I wanted you to message me that. Uh, here's the thing, and I'm going to tell everybody this. When you send me your... Uh, like test, right? Like your final exam or your midterm or something. Now that we're doing these as at-home tests, I mail you the test form through Canvas. But you cannot just hit reply to that class-wide Canvas announcement because that does not deliver through. You have to create a new email and then type in manually my email address and create the attachment there. So my suspicion, Jen, because I've seen this happen in a few other cases in other classes, Students fail to have a proper delivery because they just, you know, hit reply. But don't worry about it. If you have the uh, file and you can just give me some documentation, like a screenshot that shows the original failed delivery, uh, then I'll just accept it and I'll give you your grade. But anyway, does that make sense, Jen? I hope you heard me. Um, but I'm going to look at my emails now after class anyway. So thanks, everybody. Take care and um, stay safe. I'll definitely see you guys next week. Thank you very much.